I would like to thank all the scholars for your paper presentations and a hearty welcome to this ecstatic evening. We are certain that the valuable speeches which will be shared soon by our brilliant speakers will be all the exhortation we are looking for in these difficult and uncertain times. With that, I would like to address and extend a warm welcome to our speakers for the evening, Dr. Sandhya Rani Ramadas from Element Edge, Dr. Anuradha Satyaseelan from Christ University, Mr. Ankit Gokul Gandhi from BES College of Arts, Commerce and Science, and last but not the least, Dr. Sonny Joseph from Orlando, Florida. Moving on with our session, I'd like to request I'd like to request Ms. Dachai, Aston Professor, Department of Psychology at MJ Janaki College for Women, to introduce Dr. Sandhya Rani Ramadas, Consultant, Organizational and Marine Psychologist, Elemented Psychological Support Services, Chennai. A very good evening to one and all present here. It gives me great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Sandhya Rani is an organizational psychologist. She's a consultant in IT companies, corporates, shipping companies, hotel industries, hospitals, and educational institutes. She is practicing training and counseling since 2005. She has done her master's, MPhil, and PhD in, psycho in psychology from the University of Madras. She is the co-founder and managing partner of Element H Psychological Support Service. Her job profile includes career guidance, student counseling, occupational psychology, EAP, psychometry, research, training and counseling, and is specialized in CBT. She is a member of psychological bodies such as BPS, APA, IAP, INSPA, IAPS, and CCM, to name a few. She has been trained in various fields like occupational testing, leadership evaluation, wellness, ACT therapy, CBT therapy, and Adlerian schools of thought by prominent trainers across the world. She also uses SFBT and positive psychology in her practice. She runs the Human Element Leadership and Management course for Hindustan Institute of Maritime Training and is an MCA approved trainer. Her areas of specialization are human element analysis, especially in the shipping industry. Her thesis titled Influence of Psychosocial and environmental factors on cognitive functions among seafarers is an intensive study on seafarers and their work environment. As a part of her research, she has met more than 5,000 seafarers from different nationalities. She strongly advocates for mental health and regularly upgrades and seeks supervision for her professional development. Her passion lies in research and psychometric assessment. She specializes in the field of seafarers and their mental health. She has also co-authored three books on parenting, parenting, self-care, and personal growth, apart from the journal and magazine articles that she constantly contributes. She has over 15 years of experience in counseling and training people belonging to all age groups. Dr. Sandhirani is a certified supervisor for budding counselors and psychologists. My hearty welcome to you, ma'am. We are extremely delighted to have you with us today. Uh, we are looking forward for your great session, ma'am. Hello. Welcome. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for such a warm welcome. And I think you read my entire profile. I had asked to reduce. <laughs> right. So thank you so much, Dr. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Ragita for uh, you know asking me uh, to you know, share uh, a little bit of my experience. I'm quite delighted to be part of the conference. Conference is something I think uh, we professionals look forward to. You know, that's where we connect with the students and research. Otherwise, our professional work becomes very mundane. It's these conferences that keeps us you know, uh, young at heart and keeps us uh, you know on our toes as well. So thank you so much and thank you, Dr. Uh, M. J. Janaki uh, College for also. Uh, you know, this wonderful conference and uh, the topic is need of the hour. I think it can't be any better. A wonderful selection of topics as well. Yes. So I'm going to share my presentation. Um, in the past one year, I think my topic is coping, coping with the new normal in organizations. So we're all helping individuals, being in the helping field, psychology field, we're all helping individuals. And in the past one year, we've noticed that it's not just the individuals, even the organizations, you know, it's something totally drastically has changed. 
and they also need some support they also need some guidance on how will they help their employees you know how will they cope so i was approached by few organizations to help their you know employees as well as to bring in some structure some change in their routine and whatever worked i'm going to discuss few things that worked for them and also other organizations which have given me their inputs on i did interview a couple of organizations and i'll also be sharing some techniques that they have used their uh, employees adapt to the new normal as well so with that i'll share my uh, presentation I hope it's visible. Yes, can yes, someone? Yes. Ah, yes. all right. So this is the topic: coping with the new normal, and that's about me. That was being introduced. So I was part of one IT company, one hospitality. Uh, you know, it was a hotel uh, uh, industry. It was a star hotel and one shipping company that I worked with very closely. There were a few educational institutes, but I think. Uh, these were really big organizations so we you know a lot of efforts were put into uh, help their employees so we so when i interviewed all of them lot of common aspects were observed you know so one thing was this whole you know when you look from maslow's point of view or whatever you know the hierarchy at every level was being challenged you know so there was this whole survival will i get infected what if i lose my job what will happen to my family you know and that uh, The initial stage of lockdown, nobody knew about COVID. It took at least, I think, it took at least three to four months to get used to, you know, the new uh, lifestyle and the lockdown and everything. So initially, the anxiety of the employees were really high, and many were blaming themselves, feeling guilty, feeling insecure, and they were clueless. And you know, believing uh, every forward that's coming is only increasing their anxiety. The next level, security was also challenged. You know, many who were awaiting that. Exactly, if you notice, this lockdown started in March, so that's when people were about to get promoted, about to get their appraisals, and everything was more or less on hold. You know, so they put everything was pushed for a later date. So they were really insecure about their job. How long will my job last? Will I be promoted? What will happen to my targets, my aspirations, my relationships? You know, my workplace dynamics. everything was getting affected now they felt that the social connect was missing you know the things that you love doing things together you know when i'm the group of people maybe i may share a joke maybe i may share some gossip maybe there are some uh, you know insights oh I, this that's a better way to do this you know all those things we are going to miss when we are in our lockdown to each his own they all have to come up with their own original idea there is no shared you know the group think is missing there so you know the proximity is missing the concept of touch was missing sharing was difficult how will they share the resources communication lot of miscommunication were being complained so there were times when a person was telling something funny but the other person couldn't understand because you know the non verbal cues were missing it was only the voice you know the conversation so they couldn't understand whether it was a joke or a pun or was somebody teasing them or hurting them So a lot of communication gaps were happening. Even assumptions, you know, a lot of work. Who's going to do what? The accountability was a major challenge, and a lot of messages were being filtered. Managers were constantly worried. How do I take care of my team? You know, they were not able to you know, maintain the spirit. Also, there was a kind of identity crisis. You know, suddenly I'm at home, and you know, to probably a very senior person at home. Oh, you're only sitting in laptop all day. So, according to them, watching a TV or watching a laptop or watching a phone, I I don't think they still can differentiate between switching between apps or switching between websites. So, what is your identity as a person who goes to work, who does something important? So, at home, people are trying to understand what is it that you are doing. No, are you always on the call? Why are you tell us not to attend phones, and you attend phone all the time? No, children had that complaint. So new roles and tasks, and at the workplace, there when you go to an office, you know there are people observing you, tracking you, 
uh, and here who are you reporting to whom are you proving that you did this work right now and how you you took this long to complete it so that starvation is something that has been observed in this pandemic you know the due to physical distancing that that longing of being with other people the warmth you feel you know so um the togetherness maybe it is a hug maybe it is shaking hands maybe sitting together maybe eating together some way that you know even without knowing or uh, uh, you know we may be physically in close proximity maybe while standing in a queue or maybe while entering or coming out of a place so all the security that you feel in the presence of people because human beings social animals you know it's important that we it's an important element to feel safe to be around people so this was something that was observed as a you know outcome of uh, this pandemic okay. folks you know working in the workplace had its perks if you see uh, it had its motivators there was a kind of interdependency okay i can't do something there is my colleague who is helping me a kind of cohesion was felt a little bit competitiveness you know so you do this i'll also do this let's see who does you know that little competitive that you stress that we call in the good stress that was always there in the workplace and you identified with the common purpose you know we and there is always a buddy at work somebody you can relate to you can share your woes or just went you know the the concept of laughing together and everything got over the same day you don't have to worry about you know uh, next meeting next decision next email the person who has to approve was sitting in front of you they would immediately say okay and the job was getting done and also not everyone can have ac all day on at home no they don't have a computer at home which is as fast the server is not as fast as that it would be in an office you know so uh, and you know you have this unlimited tea coffee maybe some organization offer lunch all the organizations that i in- interviewed they offered breakfast and lunch you know so this is an extra task at home for the person to make and uh, you know um, it, it's an additional task so all this also is something that employees had to take care of you know some organization did provide a laptop they did uh, uh, ask them to buy a desktop and chair if uh, not to take care of their economical element uh, but not all organizations could afford it also so all this is electricity bill ac bill who's going to pay all that but parts of working from home was also that it's not new it's not that uh, you know working from home was something that started happening maybe for all industries it started happening last year otherwise the it had started work from home long back when they realized that you know they are able to the, the employees free to uh, work from anywhere they want as long as they are able to deliver that within so many number of hours you know so many companies were giving that uh, autonomy to the uh, employee that you work where you want and they could often work take work, you know off and stay at home that save their time on commutation uh, you know avoiding the rush hour it was a little laid back and they could stretch their space and time there was a flexibility in their routine the competitiveness was less and um, the personality you know there are many personalities which prefer a more isolated kind of work environment rather than a group so it's when an introvert extreme introvert person when they are happy i don't want others to disturb me i can take care of myself you know so and even the nature of the job maybe some job it involves you sitting in one place all day but there are jobs where you need to be running around a lot so there you cannot say that you know i will work from home so the nature of the job also decides so many felt it it used to save effort when they used to do it once in a while but the moment it become almost like a permanent thing they couldn't take it many wanted to come back they said we missed the exchange of information we missed the like minded ideas that we always discuss so they really missed the people right and what were the challenges that of people were facing so it was first of all to have clear boundaries this is my work time this is my off time nobody was able to tell that even their own boss will say you are only at home why are you you know saying that you want to switch off by 6 finish your job and come back and report to me by 8 so there were the boundaries were disappearing then when you are at work you know 9 to 6 i am at office and 6 so after 6 nobody can disturb me unless it's some real emergency then otherwise nobody will disturb you but at home boundaries started disappearing they were like 6 o'clock you get your calls night 9 o'clock you get your calls the boundaries were disappearing people were not clear about what is it they are supposed to do the role clarity was getting lost illusion of availability personally and professionally is not only for at work you know even at home 
now the children or the in-laws or the parents they are seeing you you are at home all the time so they are thinking okay you can always postpone that when something urgent comes up if somebody is ringing the bell why don't you go and take everybody is sitting at home with the system you know there is a, you know the everybody seems to be available but not available you know it is a, it was blurring it will often feel stuck and they miss the resources they miss having access to certain uh, you know benefits and conveniences at the workplace uh, many complain that they started making lot of mistakes because they'll be sitting in the system with something very important the child might be asking them to do something or somebody may do, may be you know ringing the doorbell and they have to go attend or at home somebody is sick and they cannot completely focus on the job so they they reported that they were making a lot of mistakes errors were increasing and there was a shift in the appraisal process managers didn't know how to appraise you know so what is it that i should target it and they felt the lack of mentorship earlier okay i had a doubt i can ask my manager or senior or colleague now whom do i ask for that i have to make one official call and they should be willing to probably they are in the middle of something they should be willing to talk you know so there was this lack of mentorship the observation learning was missing the leadership dynamics was more and more very lazy fair you know giving full autonomy you do whatever you want just finish and give me the job you know product so that's what uh, it was leaning to and personally individuals were facing all of these systems feeling i mean all of the symptoms feeling stressed worried anxious racing thoughts they were not able to sleep properly concentrate change in their sleep routine i think it's it's safe to say that most were reporting that they could not sleep before 2 am you know so this was the, i think most of the clients who called were telling that before 2 am we just can't either because they missed the physical activity or is it the workload or is it exposure to the blue light we don't so what 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 did these organizations do how did they help the employees to cope so they started setting realistic goals first of all so organization realized what usually happens in the office in two days is taking four days so let's not give false promises let us keep the time as four days so they started being more and more realistic and they gave the freedom you know so okay your child is running around during a meeting it's okay we can accommodate we don't mind or if you feel that you somebody is ringing the bell we will wait for you you know there was an accommodating kind of culture in the meetings and the group meetings and the calls so more and more attention to since last year the you know bps has been focusing a lot on psychological safety and diversity management so more and more attention to accommodating people with the differences respecting that differences and you know um, keeping the workplace inclusive was gaining momentum and therefore you know it was a, you know when they were shifting to the lockdown mode also they were able to respect that so they started allotting more time to meetings more time to communicate weekly once weekly twice every day morning and evening so they started increasing the frequency and they decided let's not keep one person responsible for one job let it be two or three people together a group can be held responsible so that if one person is missing out let the other take you no know, shoulder the responsibility the companies they gave that if anyone is infected with covid or any other medical support they were giving full medical support to their employees and for uh, task where which like for example your job was to go in the office and you know maybe you are part of the maintenance or admin team where you have to be in workplace but there are no employees who are you going to monitor or supervise whose attendance are you taking so such task they started working on rotation basis 15 day one person 15 day another person so it was like a rotation they ensure the employees that for the first four months no one will lose their jobs after that depending on how the business is affected i think they were gradually uh, you know they encouraged access to mental health practitioners at least 10 organization up to three Yes. Um, are you changing the slides? Am I still uh, able to see only the title slide? Oh, okay. I am changing slide from the start. <laughs> okay. So can you just? Uh, I'm going to share now again. Yeah. Can you tell me if this is moving? No, ma'am. Now, 
No, ma'am. Maybe if you change it to the slideshow mode, that. Uh, I am in slideshow only. That's what. Uh, yes. Yes. Now it's moving. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now it's changing. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, so I think I'll stick to this. If I go to slideshow, I don't think it's being visible. Is it uh, visible? The font. Uh, we can see his code on post now. Survival. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Thank you. Can you see the slide show now? Um, we can. The slides are changing, ma'am. Ah. Now I went to social connect. Um, it's still on security. I social think the slide show is not. Uh, yeah. So what I'm going to do is. Now, what is the slide visible? Social connection. Okay. But if I, I'm not able to move the slide if I share the slide show separately. I think I'll, I will not do the slide show. I'll start share the PPT only. Okay, ma'am. Now what is visible? Identity, oh. survival, security. Yeah. So I'll just quickly uh, run through the slides. We're talking about pet starvation. That's the main, and the perks of uh, you know working in the workplace, the perks of working from home, the challenges, the most common symptoms. Is it visible? Best management practices. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So, <clears throat> I was here. I think I almost finished this slide. So, what is so was that they started developing a accommodating uh, culture. Jobs are on rotation basis. Access to mental health and regular awareness talks. Opportunities to vent. You know, they made sure that every organization approached a psychologist or a. Volunteer health service, where I mean, or uh, uh, organizations like I call, where you know you can call and talk. So they started working with NGOs, where there were people willing to talk to these employees, and there were more opportunities to vent. Regular meetings also were being conducted to discuss any challenges. So that was one. Few things they also did was having some morale boosting activities, like having a watch party. You know, uh, having a Zoom date. You know, so everybody will come on uh, Zoom or meet teams, and they will come with their dinner. So it was like a dinner date, and everybody is having their own dinner, but in front of a screen and talking and interacting. So just to keep it little personal, also. You know, it's always office, office may make it very boring. So bring in a personal touch. So and they were asked to record or share their talent or a family member's talent. Many singers emerged. Many dancers emerged. Many talents came out, and um, you know, so they could always. The video was uploaded in the portal. Anybody can go and watch at any point of the day. So they were given which days to say. There was like one day in a week for two hours. Everybody can come, either sing or tell a story or do anything. So it was a very, uh, you know, it was like a break time. So it was entertaining and engaging for them also. They encourage you if you want to create memes or videos. Uh, virtual team game, so you know, they encouraged any kind of bonding that would, you know, help. More things I think uh, in uh, organization that the manager started following was little being more empathetic, you know, and they were displaying more uh, gratitude because the person, in spite of all the challenges at home, is working. So you need to show gratitude, and they were acknowledging and appreciating any contribution. And you know the word "wonderful" can do wonders, I think. And uh, they acknowledge the fact that all are equal and in this together. Um, you know, few things you can do is uh, you know sharing memories, albums, or talking about events that they are. You know, like a mental vacation, having fun games, activities, group calls. You know, so these were few things that our managers were suggested to do, and they were already you know giving. 
uh, their HR department were giving ideas and they were getting inputs from specialists as psychologists you know so you if you see last year psychologists were mostly occupied i think because more and more avenues were there to create awareness and uh, now you have so many uh, social media apps and uh, avenues where you can share your knowledge you can create awareness you can share your inputs so psychologists were invited more and more to give talks awareness talks to provide employee assistance programs more awareness more you know we, uh, we were making our organization was making a lot of posters videos blogs you know and um, you know uh, a lot of research projects uh, the regular research project took a back seat but research on this you know pandemic was people were doing more and more it was an opportunity to upgrade stay up to date also volunteering work psychologists were doing a lot of volunteering work uh, uh, helplines lot of uh, you know experts were providing supervision and training online though earlier we had to go to their place to get trained but now they were opening the doors for online training and uh, also you know it was not just that those with existing comorbidities and illness even they need to be managed i think that was also something that uh, because it was aggravating anything you know within in the covid and said it was aggravating so even management of that was happening psychological first aid i think is something that was crucial and everyone was asked to do yes. and uh, repeatedly this was being offered to helplines and people who were calling so these were pamphlets that who made that uh, had asked mental health professionals is the screen visible double checking is the screen visible yes ma'am <laughs> okay yes ma'am okay. so these are pamphlets if you go to who website uh, you can find them so small interesting pamphlets that you can share with uh, uh, you know Uh, you know organizations health workers parents uh, children you know uh, uh, giving them ideas on how to stay fit you know so how to be active at home uh, like just simple things like get up and get down use your stairs stretch on the same place you know so many on the spot exercises you can do or chair exercise or video video based you know activities the risk that we faced often getting calls was uh, because of either gadget addiction or alcohol addiction or any substance because nobody was there to stop especially those living alone and um, um, you know depression was repeatedly surfacing i mean the conditions were worsening and there were a lot of domestic violence and abuse calls distress calls stress and anxiety um you know self harm so there this were few few the things that were repeatedly you know coming and we wanted to address that also another big uh, risk was the gadget addiction so you know the social media diet the abbreviation think was uh, something that they liked is it true is it helpful is it inspiring is it necessary and is it kind you know so this abbreviation was you know something very catchy and they like especially when they, the when it came to messages in passing rumors i think it has crossed the limit uh, during this pandemic all right and we are creating awareness on stressors and uh, self care practices you know what is good self care practices wellness talks you know talking about you know, simple activities guiding them on simple activities maybe spot jogging drink some water you know breathe out loud stretching washing hands and face frequently you know uh, more talk concepts on mental health mental well being simple mindfulness practices self awareness practices thought challenge you know challenge ways to challenge some thoughts uh, how to promote social well being so these are all activities with organizations that we were doing on a weekly basis and uh, you know one one week it was just to how to help your team and family you know that's where we were talking more about listening listening skills helping them understand healthy coping and not so healthy coping you know, creating an awareness on this these were some posters created by my team and uh, they really appreciated it you know so how to cope with stress from home yeah. simple things like you know, what to do when you are angry there were many posters there right. 
and uh, you know so this year i think aptly uh, the theme of the mental health day is mental health for all and greater investment and access so i think more and more people getting into uh, this field and they providing their service i think is necessary and now we i think we can claim uh, that you know it's a recognized professional and we have now licensing bodies fighting for uh, this field to get its due recognition so i think uh, now is the right time to hone your skills these were few things that uh, you know the awareness concepts we were talking about um one thing they really liked was also talking about celebrity success stories you know so we had a group of interns who made the posters for us uh, you know with celebrities who inspired them who went through certain distress and then they came out of it so they did make uh, celebrity posters right to so summarize the message that organization need to know was that self care and mental health is important and it's not that you know you can be all self sacrificing without caring for yourself so they are need to constantly be reminded about self care psychological first aid was regularly provided building the psychological capital since yesterday i have heard many speakers talk about resilience so building the psychological capital is also something that organizations need to invest realistic goals was one of the most practical things i think tackling one thing at a time with no rush extending deadlines was something that they had to do and what who says is don't fight rather hope you know so commit through your values to conclude all organizations are foreseeing that the future is hybrid you know so there is no escaping this uh, because companies are also seeing that it's becoming profitable for them easier for them and now more and more people are responsible for their own actions they don't need an external body to push them so the shift is moving towards being more and more internally motivated right so whatever works and is comfortable they're okay with it and departments now are taking turns to come to office rather than everybody coming on the same day and you know uh, create the rush so they were also encouraged to prioritize what can be done offline what can be done online prioritize and you know manage your task accordingly so now they are meeting fewer days in the month as long as they are meeting the target more and more reliance on gig economy and e-commerce you know i think uh, what would we do without swiggy and uber and ola in the city we don't know you know with flipkart they everything was done by them because i am not uh, promoting any brand i am just uh, using it as an example i think uh, many in the city actually found uh, that to be a savior but uh, rural was uh, another story psychologist your role comes in assisting in preparation of this organization for the change for the you know hybrid model helping them in coping developing new ways to promote teamwork and mental health adapt to the new challenges and deal with it using the new normal i think psychologists also first of all should equip themselves and prepare themselves to meet with the you know uh, expectations that if i am going to say this is the new normal i should also be comfortable you know giving the new normal you know it is so that's something that we need to keep in mind so that's i think the end of my talk so thank you so much uh, dr vagita and dr mj janaki college for the opportunity uh if there is time i'm open to questions participants can type in their questions in the in the chat box if you have any questions Thank you, Sandeep. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am, for that impressive session on coping with the new normal in organizations, which is a timely topic in today's situation. Thank you for sharing your experiences with organizations and how the online interactions restricts the level of intimacy that we would get in face-to-face -face communications. Your views on the blurring of the boundaries while working online was very insightful, ma'am. and the positive views and how organization became increasingly accommodating and understanding during the pandemic was not worthy 
and abuse and how the organizations try to boost the morale of the employees was also quite noteworthy ma'am i'm sure i'm speaking for everyone when i say that each topic was very interesting and insightful ma'am once again thank you so much for that wonderful session ma'am thank you thank you thank you so much carrying on with the session i like to request dr ragita radhakrishnan the head of the department of psychology at dr mj janaki arts and science college for women to introduce dana professor department of psychology kai university bangalore i'm very happy to introduce dr anuradha satishilan uh for uh, who has kindly and graciously consented uh, to share her expertise with us dr anuradha has a postgraduate degree in psychology and a bachelor's degree in rehabilitation science her phd is in the area of psycho oncology from the tamil nadu dr m jr medical university she has also completed mba in human resource management she has worked in the field of mental health for about 25 years in various institutions such as schizophrenia research foundation which is a who collaborative research center uh, for research in medic- mental health in india and narayana hridayalaya presently working as a professor in the department of psychology christ university bangalore she is guiding research scholars for the award of mphil and phd degree in psychology in the areas of psycho oncology clinical psychology post psychology and health psychology She is serving as an academic council member, member of board of examinations, member of prestigious institutions such as World Association for Psychosocial Rehabilitation and other universities. She has presented papers, delivered keynote addresses, panel discussions in various national and international conferences. She has published more than 62 research papers in reputed international journals. She has research collaborations with professors from Miami University, Zurich University and the University of Applied Sciences Northwestern Switzerland. Since the past two decades her work involves with mindfulness and holistic wellness. She is a trained mindfulness therapist who practices and helps individuals to learn it through webinars, individual sessions and workshops. We are extremely happy to have you with us today right uh, today ma'am. Over to you Professor Anuradha. Thank you. Good evening. Um am i audible my voice is uh, clear yes. to you all yes okay thank you thank you so much good evening um my sincere thanks to dr ragita for uh, inviting me for this session and um, the topic uh, given to me is mindfulness on vuka in vuka circumstances so uh, i have uh, around 20 slides but i am not going to bore you with uh, uh, many slides as well uh Uh, the 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 explanation or the program is uh, uh, no set with uh, dr sandhya rani ramadas uh, presentation i was listening to her for uh, over 15 minutes it was really good as uh, she has set up uh, the stage for uh, the next topics to be followed on so having said that let me go to my uh, ppt and uh, start interacting with you all as i am not uh, planning to uh, do any lecture here so just hold on a minute i will just present these slides okay this uh, could anyone confirm whether you are able to see the slides yes ma'am we can see the first slide now okay okay right uh, so this is the topic mindfulness for buka circumstances um so what we are now is uh, is a buka world um the pandemic situation the um news about the second wave and whether we are going to get the vaccine if the vaccine if we are getting the vaccine are we going to um get away from uh, the covid-19 or post vaccine also we will get it and so many questions right so this is what is vuka world vuka is a a term um recently since past uh, to to end of decades back it has been coined and uh, which explains uh, when um, we are in volatile uncertain and complex ambiguous situation so uh, as of now what we are in is a buka world we are unsure of so many things it is volatile every day it is changing two weeks three weeks back we were uh, very happy that uh, lockdown was uh, you know coming down and uh, we were uh, going out meeting others and all these things were happening all of a sudden we are now talking 
again in terms of lockdown or you know um, the movements will be restricted all those things so uh, it's, it's it's a complex uh, position now we are in a complex position now and we don't have any answer to that as well so uh, this is a term um, defined by Johansson and uh, Yogna I have also given the reference in my slide um, when we are facing a kind of uh, uh, ever-changing uh, unpredictable uh, world you know bleak uh, world where uh, we are unsure after the turning uh, what will happen um, that is that is a kind of a world in the today's uh, um, uh, two, 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 three days back what has happened in Suez uh, canal uh, a ship a container ship um, just blocking the Suez canal that is again a VUCA for uh, VUCA circumstances for the economy so many um, uh, ships both the sides are waiting uh, this uh, to be uh, clear so that they can pass away. or otherwise it will take for them another two or three weeks to circle around and go to the uh, destination so again this uh, particular situation nobody was expecting it everything was smooth all of a sudden this has happened so similarly uh, these are two examples i would uh, like to give you one is the covid the other one is what is happening in um in in the economy world economy in terms of uh, um, this blockage of the ship in uh, Suez Canal. So the term VUCA, uh, this was introduced by U.S. Army War College um, in the year 1990s, uh, early 90s. Uh, no, uh, they coined this word, word VUCA uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, the volatile and uh, no, uh, uncertain, complex and ambiguous situation they were facing in terms of terrorism, against terrorism, and also in Iran, Iraq, and uh, the Afghan wars. So, subsequently, this term being adopted by business uh, uh, environment or uh, business schools, and they have also started using it. Nowadays, since past uh, one decade, um, psychologists, we have also adopted this very beautiful term, um, and we are also using this in terms of uh, uh, understanding the situations, what a client uh, or what an individual is undergoing. So, uh, yeah, yeah, again, the reference for uh, uh, the people who have coined is given in the slide. Uh, let us understand what is volatility. It, uh, it refers to the speed of change. Uh, when you have uh, something which is, the change is inevitable. We say, uh, normally we say change is inevitable. And when change is there, uh, uh, you you are uh, growing, but if it is a volatile change, we are not growing. More volatile the world is, the more and faster things are changing. We are unsure of that. Second term, uncertainty. Uh, it refers to um, the uh, to the extent which we can confidently predict the uh, future. Where uncertainty, uh, like uh, like the picture in the PPT shows, we are unsure of where we are going, where we are heading. The situation, the current situation of COVID-19, we are unsure where we are going. Uh, just before um, I was uh, joining, I was reading some memes. Um, in, in one of the memes, Tamil meme, I am, I am a big fan of Tamil meme. And one of that, uh, uh, Velo is uh, saying that, you know, hey, uh, what is it uh, they are saying even after uh, vaccine, we, we may get uh, corona. So what is the point of uh, um, you know, getting uh, the vaccination? That is the situation, uncertain a situation whether we need to take it if we are taking what will happen uh, if you are not taking what will happen again this is uncertain so if the world is more uncertain it is harder to predict we can't predict what's happened um, again um, uh, coming uh, back to the term VUCA the third letter is C uh, which means complexity it refers to the number of factors that we need to consider um, and how the factors are interlinked uh, in terms of the outcome. So, like the picture says, we, we are completely confused. Um, so, next week I have booked my um, uh, no, uh, vaccination, uh, this one, but I am unsure what will happen. Uh, no, uh, uh, my son was telling, no, both of you need to go for uh, uh, vaccination. Then we decided, no, no, one at a time they will take. What will happen, we don't know. So, at least if something happens, one person will 
uh, be there to fall back in terms of uh, taking care of the extraneous variables, even whether it is, uh, uh, you know, body pain or ache or uh, fever or whatever it is. So, um, in in terms of the vocal circumstance, in the more complex the world, it is harder for us to analyze. We are we are unsure of the um, the outcome. The last um, letter is A, which means ambiguity. It refers to the lack of clarity. Like this picture, uh, if you, you know, almost all the psychologists would be uh, happy to decipher this uh, picture, what you are seeing in this picture, whether you are seeing a, a face or a tree or uh, somebody who is standing there or, uh, and this is this is normally in the first year of UG classes, we used to play with the, uh, uh, our, uh, the, the, the glass and our glass uh, figure. So similarly, we are uh, unsure it is, uh, in, in terms of the interpretation, how we will interpret it, whether we will interpret it uh, that vaccines are available for everybody or we will interpret that uh, there is uh, uh, clear cut, uh, uh, that there is no clarity in terms of vaccine will help us or not. So similarly, in, in, in so many other uh, situations also in, in our personal life, we may have uh, these kind of uh, confusions ambiguous uh, answers uh, to our uh, questions. So the current world, as I have been mentioning COVID-19, we are in a situation with a big question, whether we need to fight or flight or freeze. Um, last year, the same time, we were unsure whether it is going to be for one week or two weeks or it is going to be for a month or so. But slowly we have crossed one year, right? A couple of days back in the memes again, People celebrated Corona's birthday, first year birthday. So, I'll, as Walter Kennan says, um, when we are facing, um, you know, unsure situation, uh, we we tend to uh, first we we tend to fight, and then um, it, it depends on the appraisal, primary or uh, secondary appraisal, like you know, Lazarus how Lazarus uh, says whether we will um, uh, process uh, the, the 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 stages, primary process and the secondary appraisal process. Uh, whether we need to fight or whether we need to cope and move on, what are the uh, you know, positivity I have, what are the challenges I have, what are the resources I have. So on the basis only we can um, you know, either fight or flight or uh, uh, go into a free state. So uh, again, I have provided the reference here in, in the slide itself. What happens in MUCA? So when we are facing a volatile, uncertain, complex uh, and ambiguous situation, like uh, in the in the picture, the man is uh, juggling with time, money, uh, home, and so many other things, job, and so many other things. Then uh, individually or in general, like you know, COVID, if we are facing a VUCA circumstance, uh, we, uh, it, it destabilizes us and creates lots and lots of anxiety. And uh, sometimes if our, uh, uh, no, uh, if we have not learned uh, to cope with the anxiety, then we will fall uh, prey for it and that will lead us towards um, depression and adjustmental issue and so on. So it depends on um, uh, how uh, the, the dietesis model uh, helps here in terms of whether uh, you, you have a genetic loading or you have a kind of positive learning, uh, whether you have learned uh, from social learning that is uh, from your family members, teachers, friends, everybody positively or you have learned negatively, like, you know, learned the helplessness or learned the hopelessness. So it depends on that, how we are managing our VUCA circumstance results in. So it saps the motivation. And uh, uh, sometimes if it is related to career, then uh, um, the, the career growth or career moves become uh, unsure. We are uh, becoming unsure of those uh, moves. It also constantly uh, retraining us and reshaping us, and uh, which is which we don't want, right? We want status quo. Um, almost all the days, we, we we don't want any change drastically in our life. It should be like a slow, steady moment. But VUCA creates a kind of uh, uh, faster and uh, quicker uh, changes in us, which nobody likes. Even whether a person doesn't have a diet, diet is genetic loading or whether a person who has learned optimism, like Martin Seligman says, or who follows flourishing, or who is kind of a person who uh, follows 
um, the existentialism, even with that person, these kind of quick and faster uh, changes um, uh, destabilizes the individuals and also reduces the energy for us to fight or flight, uh, which makes us to go into a condition where we will freeze ourselves into a position where uh, no, we are uh, we we do know it's kind of a, a completely blank uh, state, like a slate. Um, sometimes, or most of the times, I would say, cognitively, the VUCA circumstances uh, brings in uh, decline in our cognitive function, specifically in our attention and concentration, and also in our um, higher cognitive function, like executive functions. So basically, uh, the 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 uh, the impact of VUCA uh, results kind of uh, uh, it's kind of uh, making us uh, to to uh, to feel like uh, uh, we don't know whether we need to take the detour to take a detour of uh, Africa and travel around 7,000 kilometer to reach our destination or wait for one more week or two more weeks um, but uh, we are not sure right I'm talking about the Swiss uh, uh, canal issue now so, uh, whether if they take that uh, uh, 7,000 kilometer again, um, they, we don't know what are the commodities they are carrying or if they are going to wait for two more weeks, what are the commodities they are having which will perish or not. So, similarly, in individual life also, we are unsure whether what challenges we would be facing in those two weeks wait period or how we will handle time and again I am just bringing the example of COVID and uh, uh, Suez Canal issue. So it stops uh, our creativity, our uh, development and also um, kind of uh, it, it, it uh, stops our growth at all. So when it comes to uh, business or when it comes to uh, organization, uh, no organization um, is willing to take VUCA or willing to um, you no, know, happily welcome Puka. So the, tra the the training provided to managers, the training provided to the employees are nowadays in, ter in terms of managing Puka. So specific uh, training uh, in terms of uh, HR department, training and development uh, um, strategies are given to people to manage it. So the solution for this, uh, like uh, uh, as I, I was mentioning, what is happening in the Puka world now? Number one is COVID second wave. Number two is Suez Canal. COVID second wave, we all personally uh, know, affected. Suez Canal issue, we are not personally affected. But however, slowly that may impact the entire world. That is the predicament of uh, the finance uh, gurus because um, the, the entire communication, entire uh, financial market is depending on this particular canal. In terms of personally, um, uh, like uh, as I have mentioned to you, next week I have booked my uh, COVID uh, vaccine uh, jab, but I am not sure what will happen. Um, uh, sometimes, you no, know, uh, because of the training, the learned optimism um, psychology has given you, you feel like no, nothing will happen. Everybody has taken. Okay, so the first uh, um, set of people have taken, but uh, still we may have a kind of when it comes to our uh, own personal self we may have these kind of doubts and uh, you know confusions interpersonal conflicts so the solution for all this as i have mentioned organizations nowadays they have started providing training and development uh, programs for uh, the the top level managers the middle level managers and the lower level managers as well uh, as a psychologist what I would suggest as a solution uh, is uh, kind of uh, one of the suggestion is being mindful. And as uh, Ma'am was reading my, uh, you know, introducing me, I've been practicing mindfulness since past uh, two decades, but uh, close to past uh, five, six uh, years, uh, my practice on mindfulness has become kind of, uh, you know, multifolded. So um, uh, mostly uh, this this uh, particular uh, strategy you don't need to learn something you need to unlearn so it is easy for everybody let us see how we can uh, uh, do this in 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 UCA circumstances the origin of mindfulness it has um, started uh, uh, nowhere but from our uh, uh, part of the world 
uh, India as well as uh, from uh, China. Um, uh, uh, it started with the uh, Ayurveda and also moved on to uh, picked up by uh, Buddha. And uh, slowly, uh, when Buddhism reached uh, China and uh, Japan, when it uh, became uh, started, uh, they calling uh, it as Zen. Uh, mindfulness has started uh, emerging as one of the uh, important strategy. So the westernization of this particular strategy is being done by John Kabat-Zinn and others as well. Um, uh, but mostly, uh, John Kabat-Zinn has promoted this uh, in the Western world, uh, specifically in Harvard Medical School. Um, uh, foundation is, as I have mentioned, uh, early, early foundation is from Siddha and Ayurveda. Later on, uh, the, uh, the very core mindfulness is emerging from uh, Buddhism. There are four foundations, four pillars, mindfulness of the body, mindfulness of emotion, mindfulness of your thought, and mindfulness about the nature of the reality. These are the core, uh, four core principles or four core pillars of uh, mindfulness. So uh, what basically mindfulness says is you be aware of your body, you be aware of your emotion, be aware of your thought, and as well as what is which place you are in aware of your nature the reality where you are in when you are aware of these four things automatically you can put a curb onto your emotion uh, but uh, even though it uh, even though I, I i told you that i've been practicing and i also told you since six years it's a little more i'm practicing why i am reducing that uh, years to six years it's very difficult when you are aware of what is happening in your body in your emotion in your thoughts automatically you will oscillate whether it is right whether i need to become angry i need to scold others or i need to back off so all this confusion it comes with practice as buddha has practiced it for so many years uh, we are uh, prahastas that is family people it may take a longer and longer period of time but once we start it is uh, it's 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 really bringing a lot of understanding uh, in us so what uh, uh, Zon Gabatsen um, defines mindfulness because we normally fall for uh, westernized definition. So I'm also falling for it. And uh, the definition of mindfulness is this, the awareness that uh, arises from paying attention on purpose. That is purposefully when you're paying attention, when I'm talking, I'm purposefully enjoying this, the moment of my body and smiling and I'm quoting something, I'm enjoying it. That is mindfulness. When you are not enjoying, automatically you will be, you know, a kind of a robo you will be doing. That is what is uh, basically mindful. You be in the present moment, whatever you do. If you are drinking a cup of coffee, what you need to do is drink the cup of coffee as if it is the last cup of coffee which you are going to drink. How you will be drinking? That is how you need to uh, drink. And in fact, when you take a breath, you need to take a breath like, this is my last breath. Let me enjoy this breath. That's how. Uh, don't don't take me uh, negatively the moment when I say last breath or last cup of coffee. I'm just uh, telling you uh, the the uh, the knack, the technique of being mindfulness. So oh, this particular moment is not going to come back to me, right? So that is how we need to enjoy the the life and what is happening, our body, our thought, and emotion, and also the nature, the the the, the place we are in. So when we are mindful. What happens to VUCA? Automatically, the volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity goes into vision, understanding, clarity, and agility. Agile market, agile uh, uh, management is, is being brought up and it's been promoted in business schools, B schools, and also in most of the financial market, agility is being used, which is again an, an outcome of uh, Puka, the term Puka. So, mindfulness changes volatility into vision, uncertainty into understanding, complexity into clarity, and ambiguity into agility. It takes longer time, it doesn't come um, uh, just like that. You can say, okay, I'm going to be mindful today and tomorrow, then you, 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 you cannot say I'm a mindful person. It comes with practice, again with practice. You know, uh, sometimes I do get anger and I will just show my face, I will not speak, all those things, but it's in moderation. 
So let me give you one story. Um, uh, in 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 Theravada Buddhism, that is that is where uh, the uh, Buddhism uh, uh, the the mindfulness emerged. Um, when Buddha was meditating, um, he was not able to attain nirvana. He was not able to attain self actualization. So he was confused. Why I am sitting quietly and I am meditating him, uh, deeply dwelling onto my um, high cognitive uh, level, but I am not able to attain. That moment when he was uh, he was uh, halfway uh, into the attainment of nirvana, he was listening somebody talking to somebody. One voice was uh, a teacher's voice, a older man's voice. The other voice was a small child, and it seems he, he didn't uh, look uh, into what is happening. And he he was just listening to it, and uh, when he was uh, paying attention to what is the story, what is happening between these two people, the teacher says, um, "A boy, when you are going to play this instrument, your instrument should have uh, the the these strings. It's 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 a string instrument. Let us assume that uh, it's a violin or a veena. It, 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 the the string should not be very tight. If your strings are too tightened." And uh, no, to coil, then uh, you you can't make a beautiful uh, you know music, and uh, uh, it will break off. If it is too loose, again you can't make uh, a beautiful uh, music. It will be abyss for it. Will be kind of you know nobody would like to listen to that music. You need to be in moderation. That particular uh, word, like you know uka, how we are using the term uka, that particular moderation. That particular word um, gave uh, Buddha the, the 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 path for attaining nirvana. So in Theravada Buddhism, they follow the middle path in terms of everything. If you are angry, don't go to ten out of ten anger. Be in five or out of ten. You show the anger. That's that's the middle path because you can't always you know uh, leave everything and you know be a very very good person. Similarly, if you are going to eat something. You be in the middle path. If you are going to take, you know, half a kilo, one kilo, thirnel veli alva, you can't definitely. You need to have a moderation. In between, you need to have a pakwada, right? So similarly, you just put yourself into moderation. Whatever you do, that is what is mindfulness. And the scientific uh, evidences uh, shows that mindfulness-based uh, uh, training induces a lot of structural as well as functional uh, changes uh, in in the brain. So Harvard Medical School, as I have mentioned, Zan Gobardzin has uh, taken mindfulness to Harvard, and several authors, have, uh, uh, researchers have done uh, studies from the period 1995 till till now. Several studies, and they are talking about uh, um, how mindfulness brings uh, changes in physical as well as uh, mental equilibrium, including irritable bowel syndrome, fibromyalgia, psoriasis, anxiety, depression. Uh, PTSD, cancer, um, you name it, everything could uh, be cured, or uh, you know, um, we could provide intervention rather uh, to uh, to um, these illnesses as well. So mindfulness and brain. If you just look at the picture, uh, the uh, the left brain functions as well as the right brain functions are uh, increasing because of mindfulness. If you look into several other therapies, either one of your uh, uh, brains, the side of the brain, uh, will increase. Rather, uh, here in mindfulness, um, you could see both the sides of the brain uh, get stimulated and activated by mindfulness. So your analytical thought improves, logical thinking improves, language capacity improves, communication strategy improves, science and maths improves, and holistic thought. Holistically, you will be. Uh, looking into everything, intuition, innovation, and intuition. You will be aware of your antenna will be on top of yourself. Your creativity increases. Your art and music and uh, uh, no, all other uh, um, uh, soft skills gets improved. So basically, um, mindfulness is. It, 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 I am not. Uh, uh, I am not uh, uh, just like that. Borrowing some picture here and projecting uh, on the basis of the references. One day I have. I am giving you the details that it is proven, and there are therapies also. And one of the example is me that I uh, practice it uh, deeply, and I I do change, I do see a lot of changes in me. But it is very difficult. It's it's a slow process. So 
what are the intervention strategy which we we normally we could uh, take it up mindful attention pay attention what do we do in this particular moment always remember that this moment is not going to come back to you so pay attention like that and uh, there are mindfulness meditations mindfulness walking um <clears throat> mindful eating mindful lifestyle mindfulness in everything for each one of this there are lots and lots of strategy under everything and that itself will take uh, let's say each one of uh, these topics are workshop topics um, just i uh, within the given period i'm just showing what are the strategies which is which could be taken by everybody on the other hand what are the strat- a strategy a psychologist who is also trained in mindfulness uh could do um uh, uh i have given references if you want you can uh, click a picture of that a mindfulness based stress reduction um basically for stress anxiety uh, neurosis you know, um, uh, form of all mental illness chronic pain um uh, all other uh, health related uh, issues also cancer um we could use mindfulness based uh, stress reduction mbsr it is called mbsr mbct mindfulness based cognitive therapy for bipolar uh, disorders panic attacks attention deficit hyperactivity atsd and also psychosis we could use mindfulness based uh, cognitive therapy dbt dbt is uh, coming out of uh, mindfulness or very closely related to mindfulness dialectical behavior therapy again for ptsd depression borderline personality all personality issues you can you can use uh, dbt it's uh, highly that's that's the reason i'm just highlighting few uh, uh, of these uh, illnesses substance abuse definitely it is uh, helpful act acceptance and commitment therapy is very uh, very very helpful for adjustmental issues um, uh, substance uh, dependence as well as in uh, cancer and uh, you know the, the palliative kind of uh, illnesses mbcbt is a mindfulness based uh, cognitive behavior therapy for depression anxiety and just mental issue as well as other uh, you know where you need a kind of where you are seeing cognitive distortion where they are not able to where an individual is not able to uh, see the link of how he is perceiving self future and the world mbcbt is is very very helpful the last one is mboret that is mindfulness oriented recovery enhancement therapy this is uh, picking up uh, faster uh, i myself is doing a study on this uh, for uh, gaming addiction nowadays we have seen uh, children are uh, glued to uh, the the internet and you know uh, uh, falling prey for pubg and games like uh, game gaming and mobile mobile apps and mobile games and also they are addicted to Uh, netflix amazon prime and all this uh, ott platforms so for this mindfulness oriented recovery enhancement therapies are highly um, helpful so to conclude uh, any woka uh, circumstances or any circumstance which needs kind of uh, living in the present moment and not focusing in terms of what is going to happen or uh, what has happened uh, you can uh, you can opt for mindfulness because um mindfulness is stemming on the notion that live in the present moment because that is the reason when you carry a present a gift it is called present because uh you you can't bring that particular moment um you know the past is gone by future is not in your hand but this particular moment is what is you have Ch- cherish it like it love it to conclude you can't stop the waves but you can learn to surf no if you are thrown on the sea um you you can't stop it but you can try your best in terms of surfing so this is what i would like to um uh, speak to you all today and uh, thank you so much i'm just going to stop projecting and going to get back to the um platform i think i have uh, finished i have taken extra time i think i'm sorry batma varshini I have a uh, take extra time I think so if you have any questions then I could uh, take it if not uh, once again my thanks to um uh, Dr. Mj Janaki college and uh, Dr. Ragini and other uh, professors who have invited me um I I have interacted with Dr. Ragini that's the reason uh, I am using her uh, name 
but still my sincere thanks to all of you and have a happy peaceful and uh, mindful life thank you so much thank you ma'am for the incredible session on mindfulness for volatile uncertain complex and ambiguous mukha circumstances the notion that the more volatile the world is the faster the changes occur which causes uncertainty among people and the more ambiguous the world is the harder it is to interpret was very apt in this pandemic situation ma'am the awareness of our existence and reality via the foundations of mindfulness was refreshing to hear ma'am and your views on how mindfulness can bring a change in vukas circumstances was very insightful and your advice on enjoying the now to its fullest was very encouraging ma'am it was fascinating to know about the various mindfulness intervention strategies and i'm sure that the knowledge that you have shared with us today would be immensely helpful to each and everyone present here today i once again thank you so much ma'am sorry uh, i was muted thank you thank you so much and have a peaceful and uh, wonderful life each one of you thank you dr ragni and uh, everybody from uh, dr mjr uh, janaki uh, college and uh, the, the the students who are listening to me um, have a wonderful psychology uh, learning you have a very good faculty team i was going through each one of uh, the team members and they have uh, you know absolutely um uh, you you people have uh, very good uh, teachers in your hand so i i'm very happy that you are all studying in this particular college and uh, learning i hope to see you sometime in our life and happy uh, happy uh, life thank you thank you bye bye thank you ma'am i would now like to call upon dr gayatri devi assistant professor department of psychology of dr njr janaki college of arts and science for women to introduce mr ankit gokul gandhi lecturer in psychology ves college of arts and science arts commerce and science mumbai uh, very good morning to all uh, hope you uh, are all hearing me uh, Uh, as you all know that uh, the covid-19 uh, pandemic has caused a significant uh, disruption uh, life and behavior due to pandemic uh, situation and in evolutionary perspective so we have uh, an eminent personality uh, to discuss with this topic uh, mr ankit uh, gandhi he is an assistant professor of uh, psychology with uh, ve college of uh, arts science and commerce in mumbai and uh, he has a teaching experience of almost eight and a half years uh, in post graduate uh, students of psychology and also has a four years of teaching experiences in uh, ib uh, ib psychology based on the international curriculum and he has been uh, teaching purpose uh, such as evolutionary psychology statistics for uh, psychology and research methodology uh, and uh, basic psychometrics and uh, mr ankit uh, sir uh, also conduct workshops and uh, webinars on uh, r software for statistical analysis and uh, sir has uh, delivered the webinars for the uh, institute across india and uh, even in uh, fatima college of health science in abu dhabi and saint dominic college of asia in Phil- philippines and uh, sharda university and okrade international schools uh, in uh, bengaluru indus Inter- international school in pune kc college and ajayin college in mumbai and and many more uh, institutions and and he also served as a speaker in uh, recently held a 3g international conference in psychology uh which was a series of talk uh, by experts in the field of psychology and he has uh, served as an expert uh, panel a member for the interview around uh, of the ma program uh, of uh, tis chennai uh, yeah, please uh, uh, to have you with us uh, uh, today sir welcome uh, welcome and uh, thank you sir and and over to you sir uh good evening to all thank you dr gayatri and i thank uh, mgr janaki college uh, chennai for inviting me here 
to speak on evolutionary psychology and uh, yeah i mean i think uh, i i will be definitely starting a presentation maybe in some time uh, but before i start the presentation see i am not very fond of formal ppts to be very honest i am more of a conversationalist like i like to talk about uh, things other than just uh, you know i mean that's my way of uh, uh, interacting with my audience so uh, speaking of evolutionary psych uh, why why this particular topic and what is the relevance of this uh, to the current pandemic okay i mean the theme of this conference uh, is the new normal right i mean that is what i'm aware of so we are talking about uh, this whole paradigm shift in our human behavior especially induced by the current pandemic which began last year so the first question that i will start with today is what is evolutionary psych and uh, how how does that framework of evolution darwin and evolution help us in understanding human behavior with respect to the pandemic i will come to the pandemic part in some time but uh ma'am can i make it interactive like can i entertain answers from students is that fine yes yes yes, yes sir yes sir yeah okay so who can tell me like has anyone come across this field of evolutionary psych maybe some of us might have studied social psychology and uh, we might have read briefly about evolutionary psych as part of social psychology but i from what i know it is not a paper which is offered by institutes or universities across india maybe a few institutes might be offering like mumbai university does offer this paper can anyone tell me what is evolutionary psych about Yeah. Yeah, sure. No, I think it's just explaining the mental and psychological traits, maybe like uh, memory, perception, and so on. Uh mm huh. -hmm. Okay. So, what does it tell us about these traits, like memory, perception? Yeah. Someone has raised a hand. Anyone? Okay. Uh, fine. So, <coughs> see, uh, if we if we say human beings, okay, we often say that we are modern human beings, right? We are so uh, technologically advanced. We are also much ahead in our cognition compared to other species. Or at least that is what we like to believe, right? but evolutionary psych has an interesting perspective about the human mind okay we say uh, in evolutionary psych it says that although we are modern human beings we carry a stone age mind okay we carry a stone age mind now why do we say that we carry a stone age mind see if i tell you let me give you a simple example to help to illustrate this concept if i tell you that you are going to a restaurant and i tell you to you know choose something something which is healthy suppose let's say i tell you something like order a spinach and kale soup versus order nice greasy cheesy french fries versus uh, soup obviously most of us if not all most of us at least would gravitate towards the fries or the pizzas right we might not order that because we know it's not good for us but at least uh, your mind craves for that your mind craves for the cheese and all the fat now why does that happen why do we end up eating foods which are not really healthy for us right now you all know we are suffering from sedentary lifestyle we are suffering from lifestyle diseases like cancer like diabetes and metabolic syndromes so still we go for these kind of food the reason being what evolutionary psych says is that the logic is very simple the logic is that see we human beings we have not come on this planet uh few years ago it has been millions of years it has been millions of years that we have been here at least we have evolved across generations it's not just one or two or 10 generations it has been thousands and thousands of generations right we have had ancestors we have had australopithecus we have had homo erectus we have had neanderthals 
so we have had ancestors prior to us and across all these branches of evolution finally we are here today and we are still evolving it's not like evolution has stopped right now evolution is a very slow process many of us might have heard of charles darwin right we might have often heard of the statement that survival of the fittest now let me tell you one thing that statement survival of the fittest is in a way a misnomer it is not completely capturing the idea of evolution because evolution is not saying that it is just about survival evolution is saying that apart from survival our aim is also to spread our genes we are here or at least subconsciously our actions are directed towards propagation of our genes right we want to create more and co more copies of our genes if you read the selfish gene perspective by richard dawkins right richard dawkins is a well known author a scientist and atheist and he has often propagated this idea of the selfish gene now what he says is that our actions our actions such as uh, we we help our kids to uh, achieve greater heights in their careers we help our family members we help our cousins our siblings why do we do that we help our uh society members or our nearby friends and colleagues why do we do that the reason is that many of these actions that we commit from day to day life they eventually help us create copies of our genes how because when i am helping my siblings for example when i am helping my siblings in a way my siblings are carrying a certain extent of my genes right we have a certain genetic relationship right if i am helping my nephews and nieces even they are carrying to a certain extent copies of my genes right now what happens here is that certain actions which help us survival and then help us in propagation of our genes those traits those traits or those characteristics are likely to be passed on from one generation to another why because they have helped the organism to survive and to reproduce now speaking of the food wall example the food the fatty food example that i mentioned now when we say a french fries or a pizza now obviously that did not exist when our ancestors used to roam the plains of africa right one perspective the out of africa perspective in evolutionary side says that humans have uh, spread across the world from the savannas of east africa now where exactly the origin was again there are debates like some people say that humans originated in what today is the east african country of kenya and even tanzania some people say that humans originated in ethiopia some people say that humans originated in botswana so there are a lot of debates there are people who also propagate that it did not origin from africa originate from africa but we were there in different parts of the world so whatever the case may be for a moment let us assume that we originated from africa uh see we never had those luxuries of having food at our disposal right as ancestors like i'm talking about millions of years ago okay i'm not talking about homo sapiens sapiens i'm talking about millions of years ago i'm talking about australopithecus i'm talking about homo erectus etc all our ancestors before the modern human being so because we didn't have those luxuries of getting food at our disposal often we had to go out and hunt right we had to go out and hunt for meat we had to go out and uh, we had to forage for fruits and vegetables and roots right so it was not easy for us to locate food now what happens here is that whenever we are deprived of food it makes sense for our bodies to have foods which are rich in calories right it makes sense for us to have food which are rich in calories so when i say a small pound of meat a 1 pound of meat which is very rich in calories compared to let's say uh, a 1 kilo of vegetables now obviously a 1 kilo of vegetables although it is heavier than 1 pound of meat but when it talks about when we talk about density in calories a 1 pound of meat is more dense in calories compared to vegetables of 1 kilo now so it makes sense for human beings to prefer those foods which are fatty and greasy because why they helped us to pull through the harsh days on the african plains when we did not get food for days on end right so the same logic the same logic many of our emotions many of our emotions 
such as anger, rage, jealousy, disgust, all these emotions, even sadness and depression for that matter, even disorders like eating disorders, many of these are rooted back in our ancestral environment. Why? Because they helped us to survive. Yes, you heard me correctly. Negative emotions or the so-called negative emotions such as disgust, such as jealousy. We know they are not healthy, right? It is not good to be jealous. We all know that. But still, those emotions are existing in our minds. I mean, they activate certain parts of your brain, right? We all get possessive about our partners or about our friends, even though we know it is not healthy for us to do that. Why is that so? So, evolutionary psych would say that these emotions help us to retain certain things, retain certain things or certain people to ourselves. Jealousy helped us to retain our loved one. Jealousy helped us to take measures to keep away rivals, to keep away competitors so that they do not snatch away our partners. Right? Now that is not a justification. Understand this. Evolution is not justifying any of these behaviors. Evolutionary psych just says that this is what it is and this is the reason why it is existing in us today. Right. Now, uh, speaking of disgust, okay, let's talk about disgust. There are certain things, there are certain common elements which disgust us across the world. There are certain sights and certain odors which repulse you and which repulse me. Right? Why, why, why do these disgust, disgusting elements act commonly across cultures? See, if you talk about, let's talk about a woman who is expecting, a pregnant woman. Now, uh, many of us might have heard or some of, uh, uh, you know, some of you might be knowing people in your vicinity or many of you might be mothers and might have experienced uh, pregnancy. Uh, see, we know that there are certain foods during pregnancy which disgust us like, you know, bitter foods even things like coffee certain things that we love having in a usual course of affairs while pregnancy the same foods cause some kind of a nausea in that person why does that happen because evolution says that that disgust or that nausea during pregnancy helps the mother stay away from toxin uh, toxins and foods which are potentially harmful to the fetus right so it is perfectly fine if someone experiences nausea. Fever, fever for that matter. Fever, we all pop a paracetamol or a crocin whenever we have a fever, right? The doctor would tell you that have a crocin when you have a fever. But what would evolution say about this? So there is this branch of uh, medicine or a perspective in medicine known as Darwinian medicine. Darwinian medicine says that certain natural responses of your body are designed in such a way that helps you fight the infection or the illness. So fever is one such mechanism which helps the pathogens in your body uh, in terms of reducing the replication rate. Okay, fever helps in reducing the replication rate of pathogens in your body. So what happens is it has been seen, research has indicated, uh, there is a book, for those who might be interested, there is a book known as Why We Get Sick. You can note the name of the book, Why We Get Sick. It says that even there is another book, Evolutionary Psychology, uh, A New Science of the Mind by David Buss, which says that when we have paracetamol or crocin, what happens is we end up reducing the fever, but we end up delaying our recovery from the infection. Because why? This fever is like aiding our uh, revival or recovery process. Right? Now, speaking of... Uh, Romantic relationships, speaking of romantic relationships, like there are certain stereotypes, there are certain stereotypes which say that, okay, men prefer these characteristics when they are looking for a partner. Women prefer these characteristics when they're looking for a partner. There are certain stereotypes that we all come across in movies or in day-to-day -day conversations. But what does evolutionary psych say? Evolutionary psych says that there might be some truth in that, right? Certain stereotypes are not just stereotypes, but they are facts. And cross-cultural studies by David Buss and many others 
have demonstrated that there are certain preferences that males and females have which are unique to them for example for example when we talk about males when we talk about males studies across cultures have demonstrated that males are more likely to prefer characteristics such as uh, physical attractiveness youth beauty why is that so it is not just the shallow perspective that we all uh, hear in the media because it is uh, we often hear that it is just due to the upbringing or due to family values evolutionary psych would beg to differ evolutionary psych would say i am talking pure science here right i am talking about scientific facts you can refer to books such as evolutionary psych by david buss uh, <coughs> so evolutionary psych says that these features like physical attractiveness beauty youth these features are indicators to men indicators of fertility indicators of reproductive potential now these are not conscious decisions understand and this no no person is going to consciously analyze these things okay the opposite person has these characteristics which means the opposite person has reproductive potential or fertility or uh, good health or good genes no no one is going to do that evolutionary psych says that these are subconscious mechanisms operating at the back of your mind which propel you to make certain decisions which propel you to choose certain kind of uh you know uh, elements or people like if i talk about physical attractiveness and beauty which evolutionary psych says that men would prefer why because that indicates good child bearing capacity now this is not something that a man is likely to think consciously understand this evolutionary psych says that these are indirect indicators right <laughs> see in animals in the animal kingdom let us talk about the animal kingdom when a female when a female is in estrus or is in heat in the animal kingdom there are certain bodily cues that a female emits there are uh, redness and swelling in the genital areas there are certain you know pheromones which are also released which the male would detect that the female is in heat so those are direct cues of fertility or reproductive potential that a male perceives in the animal kingdom in human beings in human beings in our species we have something known as cryptic ovulation we have something known as cryptic ovulation what is cryptic cryptic means something which is hidden you must have heard of this term cryptography right cryptography is what the science of hidden messaging and communication so cryptic ovulation is basically the concept of that a man cannot know when the woman is in a peak phase of her menstrual cycle that is when she is likely to conceive right so certain indicators what i just mentioned some time back certain bodily indicators give a message to the person that okay the chances of reproduction are the highest at this particular point of time but that is not a conscious decision no man is going to think like that similarly let us talk about women now evolutionary psych says that women also look out for certain indicators in men certain features like broad shoulders upper body strength uh you know a strong jaw line possibly even a beard why why does that happen because these are signs that a man is likely to be good in acquiring resources now when i say acquiring resources from an ancestral perspective when we talk about our human beings early human beings that means not money or wealth that means getting food successfully strong shoulders or any such masculine characteristics what we associate typically with masculinity that indicated potential success in hunting right on the african savannas so those same features which held the ancestral man to hunt those same features which indicate masculinity today in the modern human being context that indicates dominance in a man and dominance is also a predictor of resource acquisition capacity so that is what evolutionary psych would you know help us understand like typically if you talk about sociology or any other social science we often have this perspective known as the standard social science model what is the standard social science model standard social science model says that everything that we are today that is just due to upbringing that human mind is a blank slate we are born with 
you know, an absolutely blank mind and whatever we are today, it is often due to learning from our families. Evolutionary side would say that is a wrong perspective. Culture is often important. Yes, I'm not denying. Family is a very powerful force. Your culture, your society is a very powerful force in bringing you or shaping you. But saying that we are products of culture and biology has no role to play, that would again be a misnomer. That would be taking things too far. It is obviously an interaction between the biological predispositions and the culture, right? So evolution says that biological predispositions are existing in our minds right from childhood. Now, let me show you something. Let me show you something. Uh, just a bit. Yeah. Can you see the screen in front of me? Yeah. Okay. So, <coughs> if I tell you, you have a rule to test. The rule is, if there is a vowel on one side, then there is an even number on the other side of the card. Right? You have to turn over one or two cards, maximum two cards, to test whether the rule is followed or no. The rule is if there is a vowel on one side, then it has to be an even number on the other side. So you have four cards here. I think many of you might have seen this task. This is known as a Wilson selection task, WST. Right? So which card, which card would you turn over to test whether the rule is being implemented or followed or no? Whether the vowel, if there is vowel on one side, then it is an even number on the other side. What would you do to test this rule? Anyone? Which card? Pick the card with the vowel. Which is? E. Which card? And? And the, and the card. card. And the card with four also? So, which is the even number card, right? You're saying? That's right. Even number four. Okay. Okay. Now, let me tell you, that is a common answer that most people or many people across the world would give. But is that a correct answer? I'm afraid not. See, this is a conditional reasoning task. Why is it known as a conditional reasoning task? The rule is, if there is a condition P, then Q will follow. Right? If there is an antecedent P, then a consequent Q will follow. So, if I am saying that there is a vowel on one side, then an even number will follow. It means, now if I turn over the vowel card, that is if I turn over the E card, and if I look behind, right? And if I see an even number, okay, fine. But the rule is being followed. But if there is an odd number behind, the rule is violated. So, I will definitely turn over E, right? With the vowel. But, what most people would say that I would turn over the even number, that is 4. But that is actually wrong. Why is it wrong? Because it is inconsequential as to what is behind the 4. We are not interested in what is behind the even number. We are interested in what is behind the vowel. Now, see here, if I turn over 7, okay, 7 is an odd number. 7 is basically not Q. What is Q? Q is even number. And 7 is not Q. That is not even number. That is odd number. So if I turn over 7 and let's say there is a vowel behind, if I turn over 7 and let's say there is a vowel behind, then the rule is violated, right? So that is what I would look out for. I would look out for rule violation. If the rule is violated or if the rule is falsified, then I have found contradictory evidence. So the right way to test the rule would not be to seek out confirming evidence. The right way, the logical way to test the rule would to be seeking out falsifying evidence. That is this confirmation. But most people, most people across the planet are bad or you can say likely to answer E and 4. Why? Because this, this is a task that we have not come across in our ancestral environment. We are not, our minds are not programmed to solve these tasks. Right? But if I tell you now, test the rule. If the person is drinking beer, then that person must be above 18 years. Which card would you turn over? Right? 
the person is drinking beer and that person must be over 18 years which card would you turn over to see if the rule is being followed or not anyone 16 drinking coke so the right answer would be i would turn over the drinking beer card why because i would look behind the card to see what is the age of this person who is drinking beer if that person is below 18 years then the rule is being violated right so drinking beer is one card that i will turn over and the other card that i will turn over is 16 years what you said was correct right by 16 years because if the 16 year old person is drinking beer then the rule is being violated right i am not interested in what the 22 year old person is drinking he can or she can drink coke or beer i don't mind i don't care what i care about is that the 16 year old person should not be drinking beer right now in this particular kind of task people do well people do answer correctly compared to the previous task why because this is a task where there is a potential of someone cheating or someone breaking a rule a human being breaking a rule right now we are equipped to solve this task because our ancestors were likely to encounter such situations where someone would break a rule so we and that is our minds are designed to detect cheaters but our minds are not designed to solve an abstract task such as vowel and even number why because we never faced those situations in ancestral environment right now coming to the pandemic coming to the pandemic <coughs> see we often see uh, say that stereotyping is not healthy right we often learn in our a bachelor's that stereotyping and prejudice is not healthy right it is obviously something which is undesirable but what does evolutionary psych say evolutionary psych says that stereotyping is again a functional mechanism it is not saying it is a right thing it is saying it's a functional mechanism that is it has helped our ancestors in the past to process a lot of information very quickly why because see sometimes there are life and death situations and in those life and death situations if i take too much time in processing information then i am likely to perish i am likely to die and i am likely to not propagate my genes so stereotyping has helped us to stay safe stereotyping has helped us to stay safe from threats right so when we talk about disease let us talk about disease in general so what happens is during disease especially during infectious diseases like the current pandemic covid-19 pandemic which is infectious there is a human tendency there is a human tendency to categorize people as us versus them in group versus out group why is that so because this categorization of us versus them it is helping our ancestors and even helping us today to stay safe we often have heard in the newspapers or in the news channels where people have discriminated against people having covid or any other infectious disease why is that so because that helps them although it is wrong obviously it is wrong ethically it is wrong but that has helped them to keep a distance from them when i say them i am talking about the out group all of us have heard about this in group out group theory in social psychology right so that's the same logic here so when a pathogen is prevalent when a pathogen is prevalent our minds are more likely to create boundaries as in people who do not have the pathogen in them and people who have the pathogen in them so that is part of your behavioral immune system i repeat that is part of your behavioral immune system that is your behavior is acting as your immune system it is acting as a shield protecting you from them them as in the potential threats now it's like you know whenever there is whenever there is a smoke in the house it might be smoke due to smoking cigarettes or a harmless smoke but the smoke alarm in your house or in the shopping mall is likely to go on why it is not going to distinguish whether it is due to smoking or whether it is due to fire it is likely to get triggered that is that is the same logic your minds are likely to get triggered at the slightest possibilities of threat so when you hear someone having an infectious disease you are likely to say oh i need to stay away from this person and that is the logic of you know threat management and that is also the ground of uh, you can say the origin of prejudice 
so prejudice or what we say this feeling of hatred or undesirable attitudes towards certain groups which causes discriminatory actions uh, we have heard of prejudicial actions like homophobia like prejudice towards people of color etc why because this tendency of human beings is helping them to stay safe helping the in group members to spread more and more copies of their genes at the expense of the out group right so illness illness is one trigger and that is the reason why xenophobia or we have heard of prejudice towards certain religious backgrounds when the covid pandemic began last year in march or february we often heard of instances where people of certain religious backgrounds were discriminated against they were blamed for the spread of the pandemic why because it is easy for us to find or attribute some uh some event to some source we all need or we all need this pattern we all need to find this origin as to where this thing began and scapegoating or finding someone who started this pandemic even though he might not have started that pandemic but it is easy for us to blame why because it helps us to gain control over the situation that is what evolutionary psychology would say so that is also the reason why conspiracy theories are often prevalent during the pandemic like when the pandemic began many people said that it is a chinese virus that china created this virus as a biological weapon why is that so because it is also easy for us to blame another country so that we can take actions to safeguard against outbreaks and often human beings seek out reasons behind an event which they cannot understand it is very difficult for us to accept events which are not easy to comprehend we often need some reason or some attribution to help us make sense of the situation and that is why conspiracy theories even the current conspiracy theories around the covid vaccine many people say that the covid vaccine is a ploy by the government a ploy of the western nations to make money a ploy by the pharma industry why because there are so many instances of covid vaccine not working the way it should be but does that mean these conspiracy theories are right statistically no they are not right why because the vaccines do work although not perfect but they do work there might be some odd instances where they have failed to work or they have caused adverse reactions but those are statistical anomalies those are rare events right on an average if we talk about the larger population if we talk about the law of large numbers and statistics on an average vaccines have helped us to eradicate many infectious diseases in the past so do not let your ancient mind ancient when i say ancient i'm talking about the mind which has evolved across thousands of generations do not let your ancient mind which is rooted back in the past generations i'm not talking about orthodoxy or value system no i'm talking about this ancient in terms of the lineage the evolutionary lineage right do not let your mind go into this smoke detection alarm system step back and ask yourself is my mind overreacting to certain threats are these threats real threats or are these just perceived threats that my mind biologically has helped me to stay safe from right and that is where you know your conspiracy theories will start to lose their hold over your system over your emotions right and in fact i will just share the one last thing we conducted a study last year we conducted a study me and my students of vivekanand college where i am teaching in mumbai we conducted a small experimental study where we asked participants that think of the last time when you fell ill due to an infection and we asked them to write and another group a control group was told think of a daily routine that you do every day and then we asked them each group that is one who wrote about illness and one who wrote about the normal neutral situation we asked each group as to imagine we are giving you 100 and you are asked to shop for certain characteristics in your child obedience independence intelligence etc you can shop for any of these characteristics with 100 dollars you can buy these characteristics what would you buy this is known as a budget allocation task so as per our hypothesis many participants gave a good amount of dollars or budget to traits like obedience why is that so because especially in which group in the group which was asked to write about the illness why because evolutionary psych says that when an illness is prevalent when there is a threat to our survival to our mortality 
you are likely to emphasize on group solidarity you are likely to emphasize on being together with the group so traits like obedience traits like compliance conformity to the group norms help us to stay safe and traits like independence going against the group norms is a threat to our survival because if people go against the group norms that is a threat to the organism in surviving it makes sense for us to stay together banded so that is the logic why dollars were assigned more to obedience as compared to other traits when they wrote about illness with that i end my talk any questions questions did that make sense yes sir thank you very much okay um, padma or uh, insulin yes ma'am thank you sir for such an insightful speech uh, we are sure that your speech on this evolutionary perspective on Uh, human behavior and this pandemic era was uh, very useful and informative to our audience uh, and the fact that uh, many problems today which uh, humans face have their roots back in millions of years ago uh, and which, and they were crucial for our survival was very mind blowing and uh, to say the least uh, special thanks for the recommendation of various books on evolutionary uh, psychology we are sure that they are very beneficial to our listeners and the explanation of the sage behavior to its evolutionary background and essence was very uh, quite impressive and with regard to the pandemic also uh, we are we are sure that your explanations on uh, persistent issues opened up perspective to view this new normal as a in a brand new way once again thank you sir thank you thank you i'm glad uh, that or i hope at least that my session has given insights to the audience and i once again repeat that those who are interested in this field can refer to good books why we fall sick there's another book known as uh, evolutionary psych the new science of the mind by david buss and uh, if i think of any other books i'll definitely let you know and those who want to get in touch with me about further references can definitely email me as well i will write my email in the chat box Yeah, that's my email in the chat box. You may get in touch with me for any doubts that you may have. With that, I think I will take your leave. And I thank once again. Uh, I thank the college for inviting me here, and I really appreciate this wonderful gesture of, you know, collaborating with experts across various disciplines and disseminating knowledge and information. Thank you once again, ma'am. Thank you to M J Janaki College. And yeah, have a good day. Thank you, sir. Uh, so now to move on, I would request Ms. Darshini, Assistant Professor, Department of Psychology of Dr. Anjar Janaki College of Arts and Science for Women, to introduce Dr. Sonny Joseph, clinical psychologist and psychiatrist, Orlando, Florida, U.S. Good evening. It gives me immense privilege to introduce the next speaker. Dr. Sonny Joseph is a clinical psychologist and a psychiatrist from Orlando, Florida, U.S. Doctor had completed his bachelor's from the Union Christian College, Kerala, where he had the best college experiences among the others. While pursuing his master's, he was taught by Dr. George, who was a student of Professor Isink at the University of London. He has completed his PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Ottawa. Sir had pursued medicine and did post graduation in psychiatry from the University of Juarez, Mexico, and Jefferson Medical College, Philadelphia. Doctor has also completed masters in public health from the MIT and Harvard University, where he had to meet the renowned behavioral psychologist Professor B. F. Skinner, who was working at the Harvard. He has been the clinical director of mental health clinic. Baru, Alaska. He has published numerous papers in well-renowned journals. His interest includes preventive medicine, lifestyle, food choices, exercise, and medications for healthy life and preventing disease. 
We are extremely happy to have you with us today, sir. Without any further delay, I invite you to take over the session. Hello? Oh, yes, sir. We can hear you yes. now. Yes. you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. I can't uh, see myself on my screen. I don't know if I'm doing anything wrong, but as long as you can hear me, that's great. Uh, good evening to uh, everybody uh, here from here in the U.S. and greetings from United States. Um, it is uh, about nine o'clock in the morning on Saturday here. Um, my topic is the symptom-focused uh, management of psychiatric uh, disorders, which is how my practice is uh, tailored. Um, and uh, I follow the uh, principles of diagnosing and uh, treating uh, emotional disorders that I described in my uh, books um, that were published about probably about 15 um, years ago, maybe even 20 years ago. And uh, uh, that approach is uh, based on um, assessing the, uh, the, the, the uh, symptom uh, configuration of a patient, uh, mainly because uh, it is not the diagnosis that um, helps a clinician uh, pick a medicine or a combination of medicines um, that uh, will help the patient uh, improve uh, their their life and uh, overcome their difficulties. Uh, I'm saying that because, for instance, a panic anxiety disorder or a generalized anxiety disorder can be simply uh, a, a manifestation of a uh, an acute uh, event, a, a crisis event, um, uh, or it can be signs of more serious mental conditions, for instance, uh, schizophrenia, um, uh, attention deficit disorders, um, depression. So that because there are uh, lots of overlap among the, among the uh, symptoms. Um, and that is also true for an initial symptom of uh, depression, uh, lack of energy, uh, one has to pursue the, um, the basic causes of the presenting symptoms. And in many cases, it may take multiple visits to uh, fully assess the, the depth of those uh, uh, diagnoses. Uh, so, uh, and uh, psychiatric medicines are very commonly used uh, all over the world. Um, medicines for anxiety, such as the benzodiazepines, uh, or medicines for depression, such as the SSRIs, uh, or medicines for sleep, are very uh, popular medications, uh, both here in the U.S. and uh, in India. Now, um, you know, the common, common diagnosis in uh, United States, especially in an outpatient settings, uh, are uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, both among school students, college students, and uh, adults. Um, anxiety disorders, depressive disorders, uh, bipolar disorders, which are usually mild bipolar disorders, which are harder to diagnose. Uh, and and uh, maybe a percent or two percent of uh, schizophrenia, especially the simple type of schizophrenia, uh, which pre initially presents as uh, depressive symptoms. Uh, there are some uh, OCD uh, diagnoses, but many of those conditions are mild uh, so that you don't see the florid symptoms of these diseases. Uh, in India, um, from my experience in um, 
helping, trying to help some relatives, friends. Uh, the more of the presentation is um, more in the mild uh, paranoid spectrum where people over perceive things, they over personalize um, things, uh, they become overly sensitive, uh, suspicious, uh, they tend to entertain conspiracy theories, uh, they tend to harbor misunderstandings uh, that cause considerable problems in interpersonal relationships that lead to uh, family conflicts, uh, interpersonal conflicts, marital conflicts, um, uh, suspiciousness among family members, uh, and uh, and it's very very difficult to um, diagnose and treat unless one approaches in very indirect ways. And usually, the person who has this mild paranoia, who is very functional in other aspects, uh, especially in, in a work situation or in a social situation, they are perceived as very fine individuals, and, and, and they are. And, uh, but uh, these, uh, the, the, uh, the complications of the over uh, sensitivity, over perceptiveness and over personalization um, occur among the interpersonal spectrum in a personal life uh, causing these these problems so uh, it they are very unlikely to admit that they have mild paranoia in fact the word paranoia or suspiciousness uh, people become very defensive and they will uh, hardly ever admit to that so the way to find out is to uh, talk to the relatives close relatives that have that have the best interest of the patient in mind and to present the diagnosis as simply uh, stress or tension. So it will be very difficult for the clinician to get the cooperation of the patient uh, and in my case uh, take a medication that would uh, take the edge off of that kind of suspicious uh, oversensitive tendencies. And in some cases uh, in, in, or I would say in most cases, very mild dosages of symptoms, uh, dosages of medications are, are um, sufficient to improve the interpersonal uh, relationships and to improve the quality of life of the uh, person. So the purpose uh, of, the, of a psychiatrist, so I'm talking from a perspective of a psychiatrists who uh, whose tools are at this point medications um, I used to be a clinical psychologist I'm, I'm still am but I don't practice uh, so people who would benefit from uh, psychotherapy are, are referred to the uh, psychologists in the community to help them uh, psychosocially um, and analytically to make sense of uh, what they are experiencing. But my uh, role is to uh, try to find uh, the uh, optimal combination of medicines uh, at the least uh, dosages to overcome their uh, difficulties. Um, no, I'm not getting a, a, um, a chat. Uh, area, but I don't know if I'm not doing anything right on my computer. But um, uh, in any case, that's my um, uh, role to uh, pick the medicine. So from the very moment I start interviewing a patient, my mind is focused on um, what do these uh, symptoms suggest? Do they suggest something benign? Something that can be treated using an occasional medicine that they can take as needed, such as low dose of alprazolam uh, or lorazepam, which are popular medicines in India. They call it Valium or diazepam. Or 
do these presenting symptoms suggest a more deeper uh, problem that might require a lower dose of an antipsychotic medication or a mood uh, stabilizer? Um, for instance, um, I saw a patient just yesterday, uh, a cardiologist who had the vaccination and uh, who still acquired COVID. And the, uh, since he uh, was found positive for COVID, he developed an intense um, anxiety. Uh, he, he almost as if his brain was on fire that he would feel uh, such tension and, and, and tremors. Now, it's very hard to um, attribute all of it to the, uh, the COVID um, uh, infection. Um, it could be, but it's very hard to be definitive. So the, the job was to find out whether there were any pre-existing uh, anxiety tendencies that were just worsened or uncovered by a an acute condition. Now that acute condition or that precipitant um, can be a an illness or an infection or a psychosocial event, uh, a loss of job or poor grades in a school or some kind of, of disappointment uh, or or failure. So, in many cases, the uh, psychiatric difficulties um, are simply uncovered uh, due to a precipitant. So one has to find out, well, to, to what extent the patient had a pre-existing tendency that was um, uh, brewing that the acute crisis uncovered, or whether the, the reaction was a, an overreaction uh, due to the precipitant. Now, even in those who have are prone to overreactions, you know, one still has to uh, treat it. Uh, it is like uh, somebody who has a, a a bacterial infection and has fever. You still have to have to treat the 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 fever uh, and um, kill the bacteria. Otherwise, they can become fulminant and cause septic. Um, conditions and uh, cause more serious problems. So even though one might know the cause of the bacterial infection, it is at that point too late to be hygienic and to apply preventive measures. At that point, you have to apply treatment measures. The same thing is with psychiatric uh, symptoms. Even if you can find a good reason for the psychiatric symptom, if the symptoms by themselves are causing major difficulties, for instance, insomnia uh, or, or, or crying in inappropriate um, occasions uh, or a tendency to become easily uh, tearful, which can cause your judgment to be affected, uh, which is known as being overly emotionally sensitive, you still need to treat it and to tone these symptoms down uh, so that the patient can um, be more composed and uh, think properly. Uh, as you know, people who are overly sensitive, uh, that can affect their, um, their logical judgment. So you, you, you strictly want to treat, uh, even if somebody doesn't have a logical uh, problem or a thinking problem, which would be more like a psychotic tendency, uh, you still have to treat that person because somebody who is over emotional can also become irrational, especially during those heightened uh, emotional states. So if the tendency is to have uh, frequent uh, emotional uh, overreactions, the treat treatment is uh, uh, needed. Um, uh, and uh, it's also true, uh, people who have uh, what's known as loose associations or illogical thinking, it can affect their view of the world and view of how they perceive their relatives and friends and other people. And that also needs to be uh, addressed. 
um, and there are people who are paranoid who become extremely hostile, rageful, thinking that uh, they are being persecuted. So obviously we have to address the, um, the illogic uh, thinking by treating them using uh, antipsychotics. I'm talking from a medication standpoint. Uh, to, clinical psychologists would ad try to address that from a psychosocial standpoint by uh, using cognitive therapy to uh, encourage insights uh, into their behavior so they can control the behavior themselves. Obviously, the ideal treatment is a combination of uh, medications, the minimum medicines and uh, psychotherapy, which can um, help the patient become more insightful and that insight will enable patients to uh, control their uh, misinterpretations uh, um, uh, and uh, irrational thinking. Now, I can go on, but um, uh, what I, what, if, there, if there are any questions, please feel free to bring up any time. I don't have a chat uh, area that I can see the questions. So if uh, I would appreciate if someone could uh, post me the questions uh, by audio. As of now, we don't have any chats in the chat box, sir. Maybe no, is, am I doing something or turn on captions? No, sir. Um, if there is anything in the chat box, I'll uh, read it out. Uh, there was one question which uh, came from our uh, students. Uh, it was, um, how does the level of family support and the stigma, how, is, how does it differ in the US and in the Asian countries? Uh, you know, I don't know about the Asian, well, the Asian countries in India, there is, there is considerable family support. That is also true in the United States, uh, which is why in my particular case, I encourage patients to uh, bring their family members because uh, patients have a perspective of their own uh, difficulties, but typically family members, especially a, a husband or wife or a parent uh, or a, a child uh, or a close relative or even a close friend could give the clinician considerable perspective the very first visit. Otherwise, uh, the clinician um, hears the perspective from the patient, uh, which is important, uh, but that's only uh, one perspective. Uh, 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 in most cases, uh, an input from a close family member who has the best interest of the patient uh, helps. Um, even at the expense of some rapport, there are some patients who might initially, especially I see this in teenagers, who might uh, initially be reluctant to have a parent uh, present. Uh, but in my case, I uh, insist that um, a close family member be present, especially if it is a, a teenager or a child. Um, and and in, in, in most cases, people come to mental health clinicians with uh, mixed feelings because uh, hardly anyone uh, wants to admit that they have a, an emotional difficulty. They are secretly hoping that the clinician would tell them that you're fine, you don't have any difficulties. Uh, the perceptions of the parents or others that I have, you have some problem, I have some problems are wrong. So they're, they're secretly hoping that's called uh, mixed feelings and that's normal. But the clinician's job is not to go along with it. Uh, the clinician's job is to figure out um, the extent of the problem, even at the risk of some rapport, because in my view is that a rapport is significantly enhanced if the clinician gets a very good understanding of the case. Uh, eventually, it's a lot better rapport than a false rapport that sometimes uh, some clinicians uh, feel that could be enhanced by 
having a one-on-one -on -one with, a, especially with a teenager. We also see that among patients who have some paranoid tendencies. Uh, they don't want input from uh, others. And in fact, that's a clue initially if the patients uh, request that uh, they don't want input from others, that itself is a clue that uh, to the clinician that we may be dealing with some uh, paranoid uh, tendencies uh, that are not enough to diagnose a paranoid, uh, psych outright paranoid psychosis or paranoid schizophrenia because most people don't have schizophrenia. They have very milder symptoms uh, in the same lines. Um, so family support is, uh, is, is universal. Um, uh, I've, uh, I could say that uh, in the U.S. as well as in India, family members uh, and, and significant uh, others in the patient's lives are usually very concerned about the patient and they are usually very supportive. Uh, there may be some cases where, where especially young people would come into the office uh, and present symptoms of for instance, uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, wanting to be prescribed stimulants, um, or uh, patients who present with uh, anxiety symptoms that uh, are looking for um, a prescription for uh, diazepam or alprazolam, uh, which are these addictive benzodiazepine medications. and. Um, and sometimes we, if the patient presents with uh, convincing symptoms, we prescribe those to later find out from a call from the family member that the patient is abusing the medications. Then we usually have a, a, a call to the patient uh, either to discontinue the medicine or to go over that situation and to bring the parents in and uh, get the details. Uh, so I think I answered the questions. Uh, question, uh, what are some of the other questions? Uh, please feel free to bring up. Yes, sir. Uh, there's another question by uh, Dr. Sarita Behra. Was there any change or challenges faced in terms of support services available to the persons with disabilities in the US during the pandemic? Uh, these, 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 these support services have always been available um, in the U.S. Uh, with, the pan with the pandemic, there have been considerable support from the, from the U.S. government in terms of um, stimulus payments um, uh, and uh, unemployment benefits. So many patients uh, have got, have received many people at, at, a, at a, an income level below uh, a specified level. People have received, uh, I guess, two thousand dollars, which would be close to one and a half lakhs of rupees for them to sustain themselves. So there has there has been considerable financial stimulus by the U.S. government uh, and also um, employer support, for instance, uh, encouragement to use computers and work from home, which are now covered by the insurance companies. For instance, uh, at my office, uh, we don't see patients face to face since the pandemic began. Previously, the in the U.S., most of the healthcare is paid for by the uh, private insurances. So when a patient comes in for an initial evaluation, for instance, I'm just using these numbers to give you a practical idea. The initial appointment is uh, charged at $100. $100. The patient pays typically $20, and the insurance covers $80. Now, that's for a face-to-face -face interview. Uh, and the insurance would require a face-to-face -face interview to be eligible for that uh, payment. 
uh, of $80 by the insurance company. Whereas since the pandemic began, the doctors are allowed um, in some fields where we, uh, telephone appointments or video appointments are possible to conduct that using a telephone or a video conference and for the doctor to get paid for their services. Now, hopefully that will continue because many patients like the uh, video or telephonic um, treatment and, and evaluation because they don't have to take time off work to make the face-to-face -face appointment. They don't have to drive the highways. Uh, they don't have to uh, park. They don't have to uh, wait. So they save considerable time. And in fact, some patients or many patients have told me that they're willing to pay uh, on their own, uh, even if the, uh, once the pandemic is gone, then the insurance company requires a face-to-face -face interview. They would rather go outside of the insurance and pay the doctor for their fees uh, to be able to be, be taken care of on the phone. Uh, so there are there is there are considerable support available through the U.S. government to accommodate the pandemic situation. Um, so, and now there are some medical specialties uh, one has to have a face-to-face -face interview, and they use protective uh, personal protective measures to uh, limit the spread. Uh, for instance, you know, surgery, for instance, that's an obvious example where obviously you can have do surgery uh, online. Um, but there are some specialties, especially psychiatry, because most of the symptoms are based on um, a, a review of symptoms and a back and forth conversation and clinical history and a delineation of uh, mental status symptoms and a prescription of, of medications because there are no blood tests or x-rays or MRIs in psychiatry. It's all a, a, a matter of judging and making sense out of the symptoms and eliciting the, the symptoms and the extent of the symptoms in, in, in my field. And, uh, I, I, you know, clearly my extensive background in uh, clinical psychology um, uh, helps quite a bit. And uh, I, I was also very interested in social psychology when I was a student. And many of the, uh, the psychotherapeutic uh, practical interventions are, and analysis are derived from social psychology, for instance, um, the theory of attributions, um, helps a lot a clinical psychologist uh, form, formulate uh, a, a diagnosis or a, an analysis of the, uh, the patient's symptom dynamics. And it also helps the psychiatrist to assess the extent of the symptoms, whether the symptoms are benign, uh, symptoms of simple anxiety, or whether they are more malignant symptoms of more uh, serious disorders such as uh, beginnings of a schizophrenia or a, an impending manic depressive uh, bipolar disorder or a, uh, a more serious uh, OCD diagnosis. Um, and I, I understand that the Indian government uh, has not been able to provide much support, but I hear that the, uh, the availability of the vaccines um, is enabling the country to be opened up. And here in Florida, we have been very open. So we have had initially uh, a, a spike in the um, cases of COVID, but uh, the economy is very, has been very much open and uh, now that the vaccination is becoming more available, uh, many places are fully open. And in Florida, especially, the um, uh, businesses and the economy have been open from the very beginning. We have had very 
little restrictions except wearing masks. Um, um, so I hope that will continue. And for that reason, the U.S. economy has, from what I know, has not suffered uh, very much and remains very strong from what I hear. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, due to the positive time, I think uh, we will stop with uh, these questions. There are actually, uh, there's a question more. Uh, maybe if you could just give a very uh, brief answer, like how difficult it was handling suicidal and paranoid patients during the COVID lockdown and the shift of everything to online mode, even therapies. I think this can be taken as the last question. You mean, uh, 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 just to clarify the question, uh, treating paranoid patients? Yes, uh, there might be a higher uh, incidence of having suicidal and paranoid patients during the COVID lockdown. So how difficult was it to handle these patients? And uh, especially when the shift of even the therapies became online, uh, how was it for, uh, for a psychiatrist, how easy or how difficult was it to handle the situation? Um, you know, in, in this field, as you know, it all depends on how the doctor um, analyzes the symptoms. So a lot depends on your interpretation of the significance of the symptoms and the ability to elicit the symptoms. For instance, when a patient comes in with, uh, they say, I've been feeling depressed, uh, the, the task is to find out the the level of the depression and the um, and and the the phenomenology of the depression. For instance, you can have uh, apathetic depression. People who present with uh, lack of energy, lack of interest in activities that you that they used to enjoy, um, uh, over uh, sleeping tendencies, um, or there can be a depression where patients are very anxious. Uh, of worrying too much, being overly sensitive, becoming tearful for with very little uh, provocation, and and especially when patients have always been overly uh, sensitive. So there are different medications that are uh, used for these purposes. For instance, if somebody is uh, presents with a depression that has an oversensitivity. Uh, to their presentation, we tend to prefer the SSRI type of medicines such as fluoxetine or sertraline or peroxetine or escitalopram. Um, uh, Whereas if they present with an apathetic type of depression, we tend to present the, uh, the to prefer the more energizing medicines such as bupropion or venlafaxine along with a very low dose of this atypical antipsychotic, which is which works as an antidepressant called um, aripiprosol. I'm using generic names because if I use the brand names, most of you will not be able to follow. Uh, and the same with uh, anxiety. Uh, and and in, even in a depression, you also, also have to find out that whether the patient is experiencing morbid thoughts, negative thoughts, which can lead into this uh, paranoia. The, now, paranoia is very difficult to diagnose because you can't ask a patient, are you paranoid? They are never going to agree to that. So the, the indirect way of finding out that uh, somebody has a paranoid tendency is to ask them, are you, do you, are you able to perceive things uh, very well? Now, that, to the patient that might think like that's, that's, a, that's a good thing. Uh, are you, do you have a sixth sense? Um, are you, do you f feel that people judge you? Um, do you feel like the, the world is um, against you? Uh, so you have to approach it indirectly. So the, the, the doctor or the psychologist has to be a little sneaky to find out if they harbor uh, or paranoid tendencies or do you over personalized things do you hold grudge are you are is it difficult for you to let go of of grudges if somebody has let you down um is it hard for you to let go of that person 
do you do you carry the grudges uh, with you? Is it is it difficult for you to forget if somebody has done you wrong? Now, not always they are paranoid, but more likely than not, when people over perceive and, and over personalize things, there is a tinge of paranoia. So you you have to uh, at least uh, elaborate on that, uh, perhaps by uh, checking with a close family member uh, that well they are prone to being uh, distrustful and suspicious, and they they think they take things too personally. Now, uh, I haven't we haven't seen any suicides that are attributed to to the COVID. There's always been uh, suicides. Uh, uh, and that's uh, patients with uh, more severe mental disorders are, are at high risk for suicide because they are going through such a, an emotional turmoil for them to to find a, a, an end to this this turmoil suicide is a means we, we, we never justify suicide because there are treatments available but I'm just trying to uh, explain the dynamics so we always try to treat it and help the patient. Um, but uh, I haven't seen any increases in suicide just because of the COVID. We have always had occasional suicides that occur. And I'm sure that's true both in the US and in India. And by the way, the incidence of mental disorders to me are the same in the US and in India. There is, uh, there is, I guess there is a perception that there are less mental disorders in India. In my opinion, that's not true. Uh, maybe there is less, um, there's more of a stigma. So most patients wait until they are severe before they seek out, go see a therapist. Thank you very much, sir. It's my pleasure. Insulin, you may take. Thank you, sir. That was indeed a spectacular talk. Uh, thank you for inspiring each one of us for, with such a rewarding speech. Uh, we are quite honored and grateful for the shared knowledge. We are grateful for the techniques that you have shared uh, to assist a client under diagnosis by, while they tend to reject uh, their symptoms and their problems. And the advice of treating a person despite of the, in the intensity of their problems uh, was quite worthwhile. Uh, thank you, sir, for talking about your experiences and enlightening us with your uh, knowledge. Thank you once again, sir. And thank you, Dr. Ogida, and thank you uh, to the uh, uh, the college, the MGR Chanagi College, and the, uh, the students who participated. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. With that, our session comes to an end. Thank you all for, for your unwavering attention and support. I would now like to call upon Dr. Ragita Radhakrishnan, Head of the Department of Psychology of Dr. M. J. R. Janagi College of Arts and Science for Women, to announce the best paper presentations, followed by a conclusion and valedictory of our conference. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Inshlin. I would just like to give a short sum up of what happened in the past two days, and then uh, move on to announcing the best papers uh, for the presentations. The International Conference on the New Normal Psychological Perspectives was inaugurated by Dr. S. Karunanithi, where he discussed on how this COVID-19 has got all of us isolated, along with many social issues. He also talked about psychoneuroimmunology and stressed that mind and body are inseparable and about their importance. The session uh, continued uh, with us, uh, the uh, program continued with a session by Dr. Rama S, who spoke about building resilience, which is actually the ability to withstand anything and bounce back. An awareness on how to how teachers can actually promote mental health and resilience among students was also put forth. This was followed by a session by Dr. Raghu Raghavan, who spoke essentially about the mental health literacy, well-being and resilience and their issues and challenges. He also addressed us how culture plays a central role in the way mental health and illness are perceived. The conference was then preceded by Ms. Carol Mathias, who gave us a brief about who gave us a brief about mental health issues along with the trends during this COVID-19. She also discussed about the overview of remote counseling during pre-COVID times, which occurred via online platforms and the advantages of this online counseling, which included factors like anonymity, reasonableness, uh, and ease of record keeping. 
The second day started with a symposium on e-learning presented by assistant professors of Amity University, Kolkata. The symposium was chaired by Dr. Maya Ratnasabhapati, Associate Professor, VIT Chennai. This was followed by paper presentation sessions where 142 papers were presented across 14 parallel sessions. Today's afternoon session started with a uh, speech by Dr. Santhya Rani Ramdas addressing about coping with the new normal in organizations as to how COVID-19 has brought about a new set of ideas among the people. She stressed on the fact that self-care and mental health is very important and psychologists can promote teamwork in organizations. This was soon followed by Dr. Anuradha Sati, uh, Satish Poon, who spoke uh, about on the topic mindfulness in a VUCA world. She concluded by saying we should be living living in the present and believe in mindfulness as the past. Believe in mindfulness as the past is gone and we do not know what the future holds. But you can uh, live the best in the present. The session or the conference was continued soon by Mr. Ankit Gokul Gandhi, who spoke on evolutionary psychology and how it applies in the current pandemic situation. The last session of the day was by Dr. Sonia Joseph. He spoke on trends of psychiatry in the U.S. and how to find the optimum level of medicines for the case presented. All the sessions were highly insightful, and I'm sure all the participants have uh, gained a lot in terms of knowledge uh, throughout the two days. Now, I would like uh, to announce the best paper uh, for each session. Session one, which was shared by Dr. Vijay Banu. Uh, head Department of Psychology, Bhakta Wilson College, Chennai. The best paper award goes to Anki Mitra, Assistant Professor, St. Thomas College, Chennai, and uh, Saurav Mitra, a Human Resource Professional, XLRI, Jamshadpur. The se uh, session two, which was chaired by Dr. Jaya Sunil, uh, Assistant Professor, Prajot Neketan College, Trishur, uh, Kerala. Uh, the best paper award of that session goes to the paper which was presented by Dr. Manjit Sithu, Assistant Professor in Psychology, Meher Chand Mahajan, DAV College of Women, Chandigarh, and the paper was co-authored by Professor Prabhjot Malhi and Neha Pandya. Session 3, uh, the session was chaired by Dr. Shubhashri Vanamali, Assistant Professor MSSW Chennai. The best paper of the session, the award goes to uh, Professor Prabhjot Malhi. Uh, professor in Child Psychology, Department of Pediatrics, uh, Chandigarh. The paper was co-authored by Bhavneet Bharti, Anju Gupta, and Manjit Sithu. Uh, session 4 was chaired by Dr. Prema S, Head Department of Psychology, St. Thomas College, Chennai. The best paper award uh, of that session goes to Dr. Sunita Sheshadri, Deputy Director, National Institute of Public Cooperation and Child Development. The paper was co-authored by Vishra Madhvi and Minhas Amandeep Kaur. Uh, the session, uh, session 5 was chaired by Dr. Ramya Maheshwari, Head Department of Psychology, Etiraj College, Chennai. The best paper award of that session goes to G. Chitra Rasu, a PhD research scholar. The paper was co-authored by Professor S. Uh, Professor Emeritus, Department of Psychology, University of Madras. Uh, session 6 was chaired by Dr. Jayanti Rani, Assistant Professor at Raj College, Chennai. The best paper award of that session goes to Sahai Raj K, a research scholar, Chetnar University. The paper was co-authored by Professor C. N. Ram Kopal and S. Karthikeyan. Session 7 was chaired by Dr. Vaichayan Dimala, uh, head uh, PG Department of Psychology, MSSW Chennai. The best paper award of that session goes to Shaheen Khan, research scholar, this Mumbai. Session 8 was chaired by Dr. Binu Sahayam, Assistant VIT Chennai. Uh, the best paper award of that session goes to B. Krishna Priya and R. Janani, University of Madras. Uh, the paper was co-authored by Professor S. Tenmuri. Session 9 was chaired by Dr. Anish Viyapu, Assistant Professor, MG College, Trovandrum. The best paper of that session goes to Divya D., who is a counselor at DMS Chennai. Uh, session 10 was chaired by Dr. Ilakia L, who is the head of the uh, Department of Psychology, STND Vaishnav, Chennai. The best paper of that session uh, is authored by Isha Sin, uh, MSc Clinical Psychology, Christ DMPB University. Uh, session 11 was chaired by Dr. Priya Mahesh, head of the UG Department of Psychology, uh, MSW Chennai. The best paper award uh, goes to Mohammed Adil K and uh, Anish Fatima from Sri Krishna Aditya College of Arts and Science, Coimbatore. 
Session 12 was chaired by Dr. Neetu P.S., Assistant Professor, Central University of Rajasthan. Uh, the best paper award goes to SK Shakti Shri, uh, who's doing her MSc Psychology in the Department of Psychology, Christ University, Bangalore. Session 13 was chaired by Dr. Anugraha Mirin, who's an Assistant Professor at Central University of Punjab. The best paper award of that session goes to Sanjana Shetty and Baiju Gopal from the Department of Psychology, Christ University, Bangalore. Session 14 was chaired by Dr. Emerson, uh, Head Department of Psychology, Lissa College, Korikot, Kerala. The best paper award goes to Yashishwini G, uh, who is pursuing her MSc Psychology in Montfort College, Bangalore. Uh, congratulations to all the best paper uh, award winners and everybody who has participated. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, now may I request uh, any two of the participants to give a feedback on the session. Uh, may I request um, um, Mr. Sahai Raj, research scholar. Yes, ma'am. Uh, am I audible, ma'am? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, so uh, good evening, all the participants. Uh, so ever since I know about the conference uh, before it all started, uh, I was just wondering how the program is going to be planned in the online and after COVID and all those things. But the way it was organized, the sessions were planned, the resource persons were invited for the conference. So uh, very good. And all the information that were provided at the conference were very informative. And, and I could see the emerging papers and pre and post uh, COVID situation a lot of emerging researches has taken places in online. It was very fascinating to see. And I thank the organizing committee, especially to the organizing secretary and the whole department of psychology, MJ Janaki College, for making this conference so successful and uh, very informative. And we're all impressed as a participant. Uh, we benefited a lot uh, from this conference. I once again thank uh, Ragita Man for, uh, you know, for having us, uh, giving us this opportunity for uh, having this wonderful conference. My best wishes and congratulations to the whole department of MJ Janaki College, Department of Psychology. Thank you. Thank you, Sahai Raj. Ms. Anki Mitra to give a feedback. Ms. Anki. Good evening to everyone. Uh, myself, Akhi Mitra, and thank you, ma'am, um, for giving us this opportunity because we have been waiting for this for a very long time. And uh, it was one of uh, the most wonderful opportunities after one whole uh, long year in which we have waited. So I have been associated before also uh, while we were writing papers and all, but uh, presenting papers and learning new uh, concepts. Uh, and uh, as usually, uh, we have organized the uh, you know, conference in a very, very simple yet uh, very convenient way in which it was towards the evening. And uh, it gave us also the liberty to you know, speak to the guests who are outside of India because it was uh, the time zone, etc., was um, you know, uh, kind of feasible for all of us. And for my side also, it was a Saturday. And after class, I was able to join. Um, I learned so many new things and got an opportunity to interact with uh, such eminent speakers from uh, not just uh, you know Chennai but uh, most of uh, you know other states of India. So thank you very much for this opportunity, and I'm sure all of us have learned so much from this you know, beautiful event. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, I would just like to end the whole program by proposing a vote of thanks. Uh, I would start uh, my thanks always by thanking our secretary and correspondent, Dr. Lata Rajendran, and our chairman, Mr. Kumar Rajendran, who have always supported us. And it was uh, without this support, uh, we would not be here. This whole conference would not have materialized. Thank you very much, sir and madam. I would also like to extend my uh, gratitude to our principal, Dr. Mani Mekhle, uh, to our vice principal, Dr. Lakshmi Balaji, to our Dean Academics, Dr. B.C. Shanti Lakshmi, to Dean, our Dean students, Dr. Apita Sabhapati. Their support has uh, been, you know, you can't, we can't just describe how much they have supported and motivated us. And uh, all the faculty members in our college, especially in my department, Ms. Dakshaini, who has uh, been uh, with me throughout the whole process. It was, I mean, uh, the support that she has given, uh, I can't describe in words. And especially my students, 
who have uh, you know they have worked so hard uh, throughout the whole uh, conference yesterday i know how much they have worked especially today uh, for the parallel paper presentation sessions the amount of effort they have put in uh, my students are always been have always been my blessing and i would like to thank each one of the resource persons who have uh, shared their expertise with us uh, starting from uh, professor karnanathi not just for the conference the support that he has given us uh, all these years uh, as beyond words uh, then uh, dr rama for her amazing keynote address professor raghavan um, professor uh, doc ms karol mathais uh then uh, dr sandhya rani ramdas dr uh, maya ratnasthapati um uh, professor anuradha mr uh, ankit gandhi dr sani joseph uh, thank you so much for graciously consenting to share expertise with us and uh, blessing us with so much of knowledge uh thank you for the tremendous uh, response uh that we received for a conference we got uh uh almost uh, 250 registrations from all over india like uh, all the way from jammu kashmir to kanyakumari we have got registrations from all over india we had uh, even we got around 180 plus abstracts uh from which 142 papers were presented today uh like even though this is a pandemic situation i guess this was actually a uh, Uh, a blessing in disguise because uh, if it was not for the pandemic i don't think we would have had uh, such a uh you know a very the uh, number of people or the you know people who actually joined us for this uh, conference i think we should start seeing the positive in uh, whatever happens around us thank you so much everybody uh, for being with us and uh, thank you very much i would uh, like to end this with a thank you thank you very much we actually thought of uh, taking a group picture but we totally forgot about it uh any uh, i think uh, mostly it is my students here if any uh, like whoever is here can you please switch on your uh, camera for a uh, minute so that we can just take a group picture mom shall i start uh, the broadcast mom uh yes 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 patra okay mom